Arrachaldeón, eta ongi etorri Cristóbal Valenciaga Museora. Buenas tardes a todos. Damos comienzo a la segunda jornada del primer Congreso Internacional sobre Cristóbal Valenciaga. The first panel will be on the international connections of Balenciaga as a businessman and entrepreneur, and the second one to him as a creator. We open this third panel called Balenciaga Entrepreneur International Connections. In this part, we will talk about the choice of the designer of some of his textile suppliers and also the sale of Balenciaga's licenses in different European cities and the context in which this market took place. The speakers will be Victoria de Lorenzo from Glasgow, Kirsten Toftegaard from Copenhagen, Guillermo de Leon from Mexico DC, and Liz Treganza from London. Victoria de Lorenzo is a PhD candidate at University of Glasgow. Her paper is Supplying Woolens for Cristobal Valenciaga, a comparative analysis of the commercial strategies of Garrick and Añona, 1947-1968. Christian Toftegaard is curator at the Design Museum Denmark and keeper of the museum's dress and textile collection. Her paper is Valenciaga and Denmark in search of Valenciaga. Guillermo León is a fashion designer, master in design studies and PhD student in interdisciplinary cultural stu studies. His talk is called The Spirit of Cristobal Valenciaga in Mexico, Borderless Spanish Haute Couture. And Liz Traganza is a curator at the Colchester and Ipswich Museum Service. She holds a PhD on Frederick Stark and London Wholesale Couture. Her paper is copying a master London Wholesale Couture and Cristobal Valenciaga in the 1950s. At the end of the intervention of Liz Trugansa, we will have the uh, Q&A session. You can send them while uh, the speakers are talking to congress at fbalenciaga.com. I now hand the floor to Victoria de Lorenzo. You have the floor. Before I begin, I would like to thank Dr. Anna Balda and the Museo for having organized and delivered this fabulous conference in spite of the circumstances. This paper would have never been possible without the extraordinary help of Lorenz Gari, current CEO of Gari, archivist Donatella Basla from the Archivi del Grupo Managing Docenia, and Gaspar de Massé from Archiv Valenciaga. Finally, I would like to thank Professor Leslie Miller, a master through whose hands it all began. This is a paper on two supplies only from a total of 74 textile suppliers, so material direct excluded, that Valenciaga employed for the period between 1937 and 1968. But my interest in these two companies lies precisely in the fact that they lacked a legacy on which to build a narrative of tradition, nor were they French. They were first excluded from the stimulus of financial support that the French government offered to couturiers who employed French-made fabrics. First, by excluding the potential economic support buyers, it is easier to separate and trace which factors actually allowed suppliers to reach and sell to Balenciaga and beyond. In order to understand those factors or commercial strategies, I have divided this presentation as follows. First, an introduction on the difference in attention to woolens between Cristobal Balenciaga's literature versus consumption evidence. Second, a contextual setting for Gariga Mañona. And third, and for the sake of time, I will focus on two commercial strategies Project development and environmental assets. Final remarks will conclude the paper. Achieving Balenciaga's approval as a textile supplier was not an easy job. His textile selection process was a ritualistic examination, and he could be some of his um, one of his suppliers claimed somewhat annoying. Yet it was a crucial procedure 
for the business he led. In the contemporary period, online shopping has drastically reduced our haptic appreciation of fabrics, and cheap fast fashion are wars for durability. But for Balenciaga, his clients and suppliers and suppliers, these two factors, haptic qualities and durability, were major concerns. And let me give you an illustrative example. One of Balenciaga's wealthiest clients kept a journal of all pet purchases. She documented with absolute care all the models she bought from Balenciaga, comprising a sketch alongside its corresponding swatch or swatches now kept at the Museo A. And you might well ask, what did these clients buy? And indeed, a little bit of everything. The problem is what we, as scholars, have preferred to study. These two tables offer a quantitative analysis of models with identified materials illustrated within the literature in comparison to the identified materials in the purchasing records of a particular client. As it can be seen, whilst the client data displays a more equitable distribution of materials, the scholarship has displayed the rest decisively in favour of silk. This difference in attention has to do with our aim as scholars to project exclusiveness of Balenciaga's garments. Because in our culture we have associated silk with luxury, and woolens or cotton and linens with a more standard passive material. It can also be explained by the familiar idea of comparing fashion to art. But Balenciaga was not an artist working solo who created all the stunning silk looking dresses. He was a business person too. Therefore, if we really want to understand what Cristobal Balenciaga made and how the house worked, we must look beyond the lustre of silk. Because if, for evening, a Balenciaga guy would stand out, making the woman who wore it as aloof and inaccessible as a work of art, for a day or day, a Balenciaga of classic simplicity could pass unnoticed in a crowd, only an initiate could see the subtle cut and quality of fabric that characterized the Balenciaga style. In brief, it is necessary to become, as former House of Balenciaga archivist stated, initiates, and address the features the suppliers offered to fulfill that subtle, though characteristic, mark of distinction. Prior to Anyona's or the week's creation, Cristobal Balenciaga had been acquiring his woolens from a number of pre-existing suppliers. However, he ventured into supported these newly funded businesses. What were the strategies they employed? Though interconnected, I will break them as follows. First, the project. Second, the environment. Anyona's and Rick's commercial strategies were undoubtedly informed by the fund, their funders' professional careers and nature of their businesses. For this reason, let me uh, briefly take you through those. On this screen, you can see a table with a comparison between the lives of Edwin Gari, Francesco Lorimo, and Cristobal Balenciaga, because although they never became close friends, as far as I know, they underwent surprisingly parallel experiences that informed their entrepreneurial attitudes. The three learned to trade at an early age, prompted by their difficult family economic situations, but the three stood out and experienced success in their formative years, even prior to the opening of their respective uh, major businesses. Although Garik and Anyona were both Rule and suppliers, they radically differed in their operational systems, a distinction that shaped their commercial strategies. That it was, and is still is, a textile converter. That is, it outsourced the manufacturing into a number of weaving mills and finishers in order to meet the demands of the buyer. To do so, communication skills with clients and his own. Um, textile suppliers, textile industrialists, 
were paramount. Anyona was and still is a vertical manufacturer, but is, under the same ownership and establishment, it integrated all the spinning, weaving, finishing, and for this case, also selling processes. This required expertise in all the processes at a design and technological level, also a great capital to supervise. In sum, the trajectories of Ilorinimo and Edwin Garig represent the patterns. On the one hand, Ilorinimo matured from the making into selling, marketing his products with his end of knowledge of the making process. On the other, Edmund Garib channeled his knowledge of the markets into manufacturing, to similar and yet divergent early years that intersected in the same point, Valenciaga. The motto you read on the screen had acquired a new relevance in post-Second World War France for foreign suppliers. At that time, couturiers were offered a generous amount of money to use French made fabrics in their designs. However, Balenciaga was ready to perpetuate his subsidy to obtain the best materials. To meet Balenciaga's standards, Garig and Agnona investigated the intrinsic qualities of foreigners to devise enhanced products, but their approach to materials differed. Gadig's first collections developed from the properties of British wool, which was usually rugged, but naturally stiffer. Furthermore, he offered them in bright colours, so rarely perceived in ruins by British manufacturers until 1950s. Anyona, on the other hand, worked almost exclusively with the smooth to the touch fibres such as the Rubian Suri Alpaca and the Ambicunia or Camel Hair. These were accentuated by Agnona's designs and finishes. Its aim, and I quote from Inorinimo, was to preserve the value the original, that the original characteristics of the, of the fibers, leaving unaltered that which nature has gifted us with love. Coherently, with its aim of letting the fibers radiate, Agnona worked with a palette of natural hosts. Since it controlled all the manufacturing processes, each material could be divided and spooned according to its natural hood. So Garig's preference for rugged textures and anionis were smooth seemed perfect. Yet they appeal equally to Valenciaga, who actually work with these given characteristics to accentuate them. And let me give you an example of that. On the left, you have a 1958 winter collection model made with a Garig fabric. On the right, a 1962 one made with one of Balenciaga's favorite by Inona, Marta Garig's fabric reveals a slightly scratchy touch of the wool through its black and white low twisted yarns. These, Balenciaga has emphasized to contrast. He has incorporated a smooth feathered shawl into the woolen suit. Opposing Garig's scratchy texture, we see on the left the coat with Agnona's fabric. As you can see the, in the sample of the fabric matra, fabrics are uh, fibers of a slightly different terms float. This haptic visual gain simultaneously corroborate the fabric's natural state whilst it assumes a trompe effect. It is a 60% alpaca and 40% wool woven fabric. Its touch and shine However, feel like a Martin, Marbura or As a woven fabric, it is easier to be molded into the body, cut and stitched, but it retained a furry touch. Balenciaga engaged with these properties in the, mood, in the models he used it for. In this example, if the coat had been made of real fur, it would have been very difficult to adjust it to to adjust it to the body, like the Gabardine pattern this one follows. However, by incorporating a wheel for heart, the viewer is tricked into thinking the entire ensemble is made of fur. Garig Salagnone's product, product development can be seen as parallel, but in their ethos, they converge both, with, both between them and with Balenciaga. Garib was capable of anticipating the wearer's needs, 
that is, unlike the vast majority of suppliers that denied embodiment and for whom, according to scholar Shahmi, and I quote, the body did not exist, Garib embraced it. He claimed in an article in Financial Times that, I tried to extend people's movements with my fabrics. By twisting the yarn, so did Bonzi's light. With a triple twist, it even creates a small aura or color around the wearer. Nadik's words resonate with Gadik's, uh, with Balenciaga's own kinetic philosophy. And known as women's wear fabrics, were sought after by the, men's, by the best men's wear tailors, as you can read on the letter on the screen. This was unusual. Balenciaga had used men's wear fabrics in the past because they responded better to his use on tailoring. Thus, finding a women's wear fabric manufacturer admired by tailors was a definitive asset for Balenciaga. Undoubtedly, Garib and Anyona, Anyona's reflection and wearability, assisted Balenciaga in his experiments with the structure. The press praised the Garik fabric you can see on the screen as a sculptured wall the lures. Let us observe, however, how his textual and how this textual anticipation of embodiment was translated by Christophe Balenciaga. In the photograph, it can be deduced visually the thickness and vastness that enabled Balenciaga to create a coat even lacking a three-back pleats that were annotated in a, a previous sketch. The coat appears to be made with three pieces only and allowing for Balenciaga's best painted alive as leaves. As for Anyona, in this 1963 dress, was it claimed by Vogue as a new triumph of dressmaking or by an un un unidentified, un unidentified Italian magazine like a vertically treated handkerchief? It was created with uh, Anyona's 31 Planky. Balenciaga, in his close reading of this fabric, made it possible. Without entering much into textile technicalities, it is a fabric that, with the highly contraction capacity, that does not easily crease and falls well. The necessary qualities to make an airy, comfortable body with the bias cut. Although the number of fabrics analyzed here is limited to the format of this paper, they have been selected because they are representative of each company's product strategy. In Galique, Balenciaga found the selection of a knowledgeable converter who innovated by challenging the assumptions about the coarseness of British rule. Ilorinimo's extensive training as a textile technician and love for nature informed Anyona's products. Both suppliers coincided with Balenciaga's practice in their anticipation of embodiment. The products may have satisfied Balenciaga's expectations, but how did they reach them? Cristobal Balenciaga had his headquarters in Paris, the heart of the French couture. The geographical distance, the geographical and social distance between Balenciaga and Garib in London was great, but the gap between a non-French speaker, Ilorinimo, in Borgo Cesia, and Balenciaga was even greater. As a merchant converter, Garib could be actually had to be on the move to meet his clients and suppliers. His assets were those of a bicultural salesman and so he made his environmental strategies to suit those. Let me show you these with the graph. First, Balenciaga had been buying some of his silks from Esteron since the opening of Balenciaga in Paris. Thus, we can assume Balenciaga trusted Esteron. Esteron was also Edmond Garrigue's former employer. So, by the time that he opened on his son, the connection between him and Esteron and Balenciaga prevailed. It was through Esteron that Garib accessed Balenciaga, and through Balenciaga, Garib traded with the rest of Couture, even till nowadays. 
During his early years, Yarid had cemented a network that shortened the social distance between him and his clients. But in order to geographically bridge his economic interests, he arranged an office in Paris, following a more um, standardized general business pattern of transaction, um, transaction cost reduction. Ilorinimo was tied to the manufacturing in Bogusesia. He had to run. His initial social capital was there, and he could not speak French or Spanish. However, he owned an industrial empire. These he used to impress couturiers with tours to the mills and the state that were very much like diplomatic missions. These trips are heavily documented, and for the case of Balenciaga, include photographs of his two closest employees visiting Añonas, Añonas Mill and Gardens, where, as you can see in the background, included alpacas, living alpacas that were there for display purposes only. These marketing trips were designed by Ilorimo himself to facilitate social relations and seal sales agreements. So, in brief, these two case studies, Garid and Añona, have shown how, in spite of having run par in parallel, they intersected. Project wise, Garid and Añona employed different materials with different finishes. However, they were equally attractive, for they offered distinctive paper properties and address where I believe. At an environmental level, Gary navigated the distance that separated him from the house of Balenciaga through his solid social capital, whilst Anyona used its nails as an asset to attract couturiers like Balenciaga. These two examples have shed only a little light on the context, but their differences suggest that we are far from being able to establish a single behavioral business pattern in relation to why Balenciaga bought what he did and how he did it. Any further research on couture suppliers, on, on couture suppliers will hopefully dislodge the myth of Cristobal Balenciaga from the glamour of his living dresses to a view that focuses also on the day-to-day -day concerns of food and business. Because, above all, and I quote from Givenchy, Balenciaga was famous for his superb beautifully constructed suits and coats. Thank you. Thank you very much, Victoria. De Lorenzo, we're going to now pass the floor to Kirsten Toftegard. First of all, thank you for the conference uh, committee for choosing my paper. Um, first, this paper will track down the influence and dissemination of Balenciaga in Denmark in a period of around 20 years after the Second World War. Did Balenciaga's fashion ideas manifest itself in, Den in Danish fashion at all. The 20th century was characterized by functionalism and modernism within craft design and architecture. After the Second World War, the Nordic countries, Denmark, Sweden and Finland, became leading countries in the modernistic movement within the applied arts. So secondly, with special attention to Denmark, the paper will test how the work of Balenciaga fitted into the modernism. And my sources for this paper has been the Danish women's magazine, Tidens Kvinder, um, 14 sketchbooks from the Couture Salon at Magazine du Nord, the big department store in Copenhagen, and finally, the staff magazine, Bikuben, from Magazine du Nord. Bikuben means the beehive. To my knowledge, no dresses from the fashion house of Balenciaga have survived in Danish dress and fashion collections. 
The readers of Tidens Kvinder got a small introduction to Balenciaga in 1945, where some fashion news from Paris reached the magazine through a Swedish reporter. And in October 1947, the couture studio at the department store Ilum advertised a black strapless evening dress from Balenciaga together with another evening dress from Dior. When Ilum celebrated their 75 years anniversary in 1966, the head of the couture salon presented customers with a Balenciaga black day dress. Um, and this uh, dress was the only model uh, from Balenciaga and it was introduced together with the garment from, with garments from Mount Yo and Patu. According to one of the sketchbooks from Magazine du Nord, a group of employees attended the autumn winter fashion show at Balenciaga in 1956. Senior, the seamstress, made sketches of six models. Apparently, none of the sketch models were in accordance with the four models by Balenciaga, uh, presented in the magazine Du Nord House magazine B for the autumn win winter season, 1956. Although B Kuppen displayed photos with Balenciaga models from the spring summer collection in the same year, no drawings of the sketch in the sketchbooks indicate a visit to Balenciaga in early spring 1956. In the 1950s, Balmain and Dior were the recurring fashion houses from which Magasin du Nord Couture Studio picked up their models for copying. Not many Danish women, women could afford either a full made, ma full made to measure wardrobe nor a single model from the fashion house of Balenciaga. Perhaps an affluent woman could afford an adaption from a Parisian fashion house executed in one of the Danish department stores couture studios. Several volumes of Tidens Kvinder suggest that Danish women had a traditional and conservative taste in fashion. Furthermore, they also had a convenient and practical view on clothing, skirts and blouses being named as a Danish national costume. Both in advertisement and the fashion uh, editors of Tidens Kvinder were focused on the unsettled Danish weather. Uh, which probably played it, uh, its part towards the clothing attitude. In spring 1958, a survey in the staff magazine, Bikuken among the shop assistants, talked about the customers' perceptiveness of the new clothing trends. The A-line, the shift dress and the baby doll were willingly accepted whereas the sale of the sack dress was making slow progress and the customers demanded belts to go with the dresses. The Danish fashion conscious women and Danish couturiers idolized Paris fashion. Names like Balmain, Carvin, Dessé, Dior, Fath, Givenchy, Madame Grey and Nina Ricci constitute Danish women's favorite houses reflected in both the choices from the Couture Studio in Magasin du Nord and the women's magazine Tidens Kvinder. Pierre Balmain's very feminine, though slightly more conservative fashion, attracted Danish women. However, it had probably also to do with Balmain's first assistance since 1951, the Dane Erik Mortensen. The staff from Magasin du Nord was met with great courtesy when they visited Balmain's Couture Salon and for the price of attending one show, they could afford to buy three models from Balmain instead of only two from, for instance, Dior. In the 1940s, 50s, Danish couture could not be considered as original fashion on the whole. Although the garments most often were attractive and beautiful executed, fashion ideas came mainly from Paris haute couture. In Denmark, there was no tradition for considering fashion as an independent branch of applied art, but there was a long tradition for the craftsmanship. An advertisement from a department store, Jacques Olsen, summed up, 
Paris dikterer, Jacques Olsen lancerer, which in English means Paris dictates and Jacques Olsen introduces. Several researchers have successfully documented Balenciaga's inspirational sources, either historical dresses or traditional Spanish garments or traditional Japanese clothing. However, as Leslie Ellis Miller correctly points out, Balenciaga did not live in a vacuum. He was a part of a his the historical process. And after the Second World War, Balenciaga's age was modernism. The modernist breakthrough in the early 20th century was driven by a desire to break with tradition. The future should be based on new technologies and scientific research rather than looking to the past. I forgot the speaker, you'll get this, the soldier from b However, the international breakthrough of the Danish modern around 1950 was not a total break with tradition like in other countries. The years after the Second World War constituted the so-called golden age of Danish furniture design. Danish furniture design was considered to be the outpost of avant-garde. Danish furniture design was based on the study of traditional historical furniture types, not only from Denmark. Learning from other countries, Danish designers took ideas and trends, translated, cultivated, and refined them with a common, sensible, and functional view, and they achieved a new style. Denmark used to be an old Protestant peasant culture that was more thrift than wealthy. For Danish furniture designers, the optimal use of materials had always been second nature. Although some of the Danish modernist furniture are more conspicuous than other, unpretentious, understated, stated and subtle are some of the most common used terms employed to describe the simple and carefully considered Danish design. Craftsmanship is one of the DNAs of Danish design. Denmark has a long tradition for excellent and highly developed craftsmanship with the emphasis on natural, sensuous and tactile materials. Industrialism reached Denmark very late compared to other Western countries. When several other countries had abandoned craft-based production in favor of industrial manufacturing, Denmark maintained a workshop-based production on a small scale. In some cases, the products were modified and adapted to industrial production. This goes for several branches within Danish applied art and separate Danish design from the design from other neighboring countries. Several characteristics of international modernism align both with Balenciaga's design philosophy, practice and his idiom, and with Danish furniture. The emphasis on materials, techniques and processes and the minimalistic principle of cutting away every superfluous detail and decoration to attain the simple sculptural form. Leslie Ellis Miller writes that Balenciaga's clothes were not unnecessarily difficult to put on and wear. The shape of his clothes suited different female figures and provided the wearer with ease of movement. Within fashion, these functional qualities can be translated into form follows function, another principle which the modernistic movement emphasized. The Danish furniture designers were obsessed with simple constructions and with perfect tried and tested joints. Balenciaga developed an obsession with creating the perfect sleeve, which is another kind of joint and a challenge in every garment construction. So looking at pure form, it's not difficult to find similarities between some of Balenciaga's most innovative and striking design and Danish furniture. Two examples are from the 1960s, the coat in camel wool with two circular seams which form the sleeves and the AKC-12 by Paul Kerholm, um, designed in 1962 taking the inspiration from the Austrian chair 
Tonin number 209 designed in 1900. Another example is the four-sided press, so-called envelope press, a cocktail press of black silk azar from the autumn winter collection of 1967, and the bow chair, which you can't see for the picture properly, by Greta Yelk in 1963. The chair is a technical pinnacle in the evolution of laminated molded plywood furniture. So to conclude, the first um, time the name Balenciaga was heard of in Denmark was through Swedish fashion channels in spring 1945 in Tidens Already in January 1946, Balenciaga participated in the traveling exhibition Théâtre de la Mode in Denmark, hosted by the Danish Museum of Decorative Arts, now Design Museum Denmark. Balenciaga was admired and recognized among fellow couturiers, fashion designers, and fashion editors in Denmark as in France. However, there was not much prevalence of Balenciaga's fashion among Danish customers who had two views on fashion either the convenient, practical, and functional view, or the conservative, traditional, ultra-feminine, casually flirtatious idea of fashion. With a little knowledge so far, we can establish that both the couture studio at Ilum and the one at Magasin du Nord bought models for copying, but not at all with the same continuity as with, for instance, Dior, Balmain, and other Parisian designers. In conclusion, very little dissemination of Balenciaga's fashion garments took place in Denmark. As far as this research goes, neither the money nor the huge interest was present in Denmark. Craftsmanship and the language of form link Balenciaga to modernism and to Danish design. The craftsmanship prepares the way for experimentation and innovation. Working with haute couture meant for Balenciaga a constant experiment with visual and sculpture silhouettes and exploring new technical solutions. These characteristics confirm to many of the well-known Danish furniture architects. Balenciaga had a close working relationship with the tailor and the cutter of the fashion house. The furniture architects had similar relationships to the cabinet makers. For Balenciaga, as for many Danish designers, including the furniture architects, craftsmanship was pivotal. Without comparison with Balenciaga when it comes to avant-garde fashion design, Balmain's heir, Danish heir Erik Mortensen took pride in his craftsmanship, as did the staff at Magazine du Nord's Couture Studio. We do not know if Balenciaga visited modernist exhibitions with either applied art or fine art. In 1937, Balenciaga settled in Paris, and today it seems unthinkable that he did not visit the world exhibition the same year. Furthermore, he could very well have visited the Triennale in Milano in the 1950s, where the Danish furniture architects exhibited. However, it must be mentioned the big difference between the Danish furniture design and Balenciaga's haute couture. Danish furniture was meant to be a part of a democratic, socially responsible housing culture and as such user-friendly. Balenciaga's haute couture was created for the elite. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Kirsten. We will now be hearing from Guillermo Leon. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Agradezco a la organización del Congreso like sobre el Festival Valencia la oportunidad de presentar for giving me the opportunity to present my research. La 
primera mujer que me habló de Valenciaga siendo yo niño the first fue mi tía woman Maya. who talked to me about Valenciaga when I was a child was my aunt Maya. El primer libro que encontré en la biblioteca y que nunca me atreví a leer. And then I found llamó tanto mi atención y me imponía respeto. El título era Valenciaga. The, one of the first books that I ever read and I found in the library was called Valenciaga. Han pasado muchos años desde que vi ese of, libro por primera vez. Many years have gone by since Entonces, I read that book for the first time. Valenciagas. And I've read a lot Conozco of other books also called Valenciaga, talking about different stories of the designer. And libro, y entre ellas, a long time ago, I decided to Alfredo lose Ganet. myself in the pages ello, of this book and I discovered Alfredo Ganet lo que in the pages me había dicho la of this book. Este ilustrador mexicano había trabajado para Valencia. Uh, illustrator who had worked for El mito de Cristóbal Valenciaga. Now the myth of Cristóbal Valenciaga continues to increase despite time, despite distance. The maestro has touched the lives of many people all around the world. And one place where he has a special relationship is Mexico. So what's the link between Cristobal Valenciaga and Mexico? Where can we find the testimonies of this relationship? And how does this connection become materialized to become part of Valenciaga's legacy? The aim, the main aims of this research is to examine the influence of Valenciaga in the area of fashion in Mexico and also to add more names and more clues about his impact, the impact of his legacy on the world, in all over the world, and then to discover the traces left by Valenciaga in Mexico through his collaborators, clients and friends. In 2016, there were two important exhibitions in Mexico. The first, of all, the first one was called El Arte de la Indumentaria, the art of clothing. And it explored the 75 years of the history of fashion in this country. And in that exhibition, the curators showed that this forms part of our national legacy. They proposed this connection between fashion and modernity and also a meeting between cultures and how all this can be a source of innovation. Thanks to prior research, we found the names of great Mexican designers of the 20th century and their connection with the rest of the world. Shortly beforehand, there's another exhibition called The Threads of History, which was shown in the National History Museum in Mexico. And this showed how dresses had a biography, had a life story, and how dresses can also become heritage. This shows how fashion and clothes can impact popular culture. The second exhibition in 2016 was the Blanciaga exhibition in the Mexican Museum of Modern Art. Balenciaga was one of the great names of French fashion, but he also had an impact in Mexico. Now, this sheds light on some other hidden aspects. As Melendez Calante says, thanks to this exhibition, we can see this constant exploration of identity connected to a plethora of different people, their aspirations, and their practices. These exhibitions ended in the publication of a number of different research projects in the area, talking about the history of fashion in Mexico and the world. And from 2016 onwards, there's a growing interest in Mexican designers, especially those whose uh, careers had been developed outside uh, with Mexico in the rest of the world. Let's talk about some of them. Before 1950, Cayendo was an illustrator and in New York he worked with Antonio Castillo. Later he moved to Paris where he worked with Robert Pillet. In 1955 he arrived in Mexico where he embarked on a very fruitful career in fashion. Albando Bares 
had also been worked uh, in Hollywood as a dress designer. And when he came back to Mexico, he became the uh, leading designer for Maria Felix, a Mexican film star. In 1977, he went to Paris to learn to study. And before, he'd worked for Manuel Méndez, the Mexican couturier. A little later, he was appointed uh, a first assistant to a prestigious fashion house. Then he came back, he went back to Mexico where he finally founded his own fashion house. Luis Galindo sent his sketches to Paris. This is 1950s, of course, and he thought he could perhaps uh, get a job with one of the most important designers of the era. Cristobal Balenciaga actually responded to him, answered him, and he wanted to uh, meet him. But by the time Galindo got there, Balenciaga was no longer there. But he did uh, manage to meet Mademoiselle Chanel, and she, she hired him. She came down through her uh, famous her famous staircase lined with mirrors and said, Mr. Mexican person, come and teach me how to draw. In the words of Galindo, Chanel didn't call me Luis, she called me Mexican, Mexicano. She took off her, her gloves, her hat, and she started to draw. Uh, Galindo was also a, a, a maestro for Madame Gre, Gres, and he illustrated also for Pierre Cardin. And uh, although he never actually uh, did any illustrations for Cristobal, uh, Balenciaga, we know that Christopher Balenciaga saw some of his drawings and liked them. Ana Elena Malet, the curator of the exhibition The Art of Clothing and Fashion in Mexico, found the name Alfredo Buret while she was researching the trajectory of different Mexican designers for that exhibition. Buret said that he couldn't remember any moment in his life that he hadn't had a pencil in his hand. He illustrated the designs of some of the greatest uh, designers of the golden age of French haute costure and also for Vogue. He was one of the few illustrators to be authorized by Balenciaga to actually show the collections before they were presented. This was probably because the head of the Vogue machine, um, sorry, magazine appreciated his talent Boret was astonished when he was invited for the first time to go to Les Dix Rooms, which was the very well-known uh, rooms at number 10 of Jorge V Avenue. It's where all the fashion people went. And he has illustrated some of these rooms in his drawings. Sometimes he illustrates the models in the middle of empty rooms, in the empty rooms of that house. He didn't meet Cristobal Balenciaga very often, and in fact, Cristobal Balenciaga never talked to him, and he never showed him his sketches either, uh, because it was said that Balenciaga didn't like magazine illustrators. However, apparently he liked his publications in Vogue because season after season, he called upon him to illustrate his collections. He remembers him, Valenciaga, with a white tie and always surrounded by an aura of silence. In his work as an illustrator, he was well known for his very fine and delicate lines and his drawings are easily identified as being by him. As fashion photography uh, became more popular, he changed profession in 1972, and he, decided, he started to design his own fashion uh, collections. And he had a headquarters in London, and his inspiration came from his home country. In 1969, he moved to Sydney, where he opened a uh, second boutique called Mexicana Bazaar. He stayed there till 2013, uh, because then after the death of his uh, partner, he moved to Cuba. Today, his archives are 
in, some of them are in Sydney. And the, and the RMIT University Design Archive in Melbourne. We can see here Alfredo Buret illustrating in the rooms of number 10, Avenida Jorge the Quinto. And here we, he was captured in a photograph by Thomas Klubin. Kublin, sorry. And it was, in fact, only published 20 years after the death of Cristobal Valenciaga. If any designer in Mexico really epitomized uh, elegance, it was Manuel Méndez. He started his career in 1961 when he took over his aunt's workshop. Without having any knowledge at all of haute uh, couture, he learned just by copying uh, finished models and deciphering the methods that had been used. A mysterious friend, we don't know who it was, uh, lent him some dresses by Balenciaga and he analyzed them inside out in order to understand how they had been made and how they had been designed. And in fact, these dresses became the late motif of one of his collections. In fact, he was known as the Mexican Balenciaga. The purity of his lines, his attention to detail, and his wonderful eye for sleeves make his garments easily recognizable anywhere. So how does the Balenciaga style, uh, what influence has it, did it have on women and the style of women in Mexico during the past century? This is something that Silvia Navarrete Buzar asks in, or asked in 1916 on the pages of a catalogue which was dedicated to the Cristobal, Cristobal Balenciaga exhibition in Mexico. I think that this mass, on mass, emigration of Spaniards to Mexico as a result of the Spanish Civil War had a major impact on the style of Mexican women. At the same time, Mexico was looking to find its place in the modern world, and it's possible that some women in the, the high society in Mexico would perhaps have acquired uh, a Valenciaga dress or a garment uh, when they went to New York, for example, going to Bloomingdale's. Or they might have traveled directly to either Paris or Spain. Mexican women, some Mexican women, uh, some of the women who, who wore Valenciaga, we have some a very famous examples. We have uh, famous Mexican actresses wearing Balenciaga. There was a very uh, widespread preference for elegant clothes and French clothes. Especially the trapezoid dress uh, eh, was very popular with the uh, Mexican actress that we see on the screen. Rosalia Arenas, who we can see in the picture, also was a fan of Balenciaga. She worked with the director Luis Buñuel, and as she became famous in Mexico, she also started to work in Spain. And in fact, she married a Spaniard, Jaime de Mora y Aragón. Now we know that she acquired a number of different Balenciagas. In 1957 to 1959, she acquired a number of Balenciagas. And in fact, she went to the Cannes Festival uh, and she wore a Balenciaga to the Cannes Festival in 1959. Julia Chavez was another uh, famous Mexican actress who we know uh, for sure had some garments by Balenciaga, as well as Christian Dior and Jack Farr. However, when she had to rush back to Mexico, 
In fact, she lost her luggage where these dresses would have been stored. The first wife of Diego Rivera was a fashion designer called Guadalupe Malin, known as Guadalupe. The first time that he was in Paris was in uh, 1930 or in the 1930s. And in fact, her beauty astonished many Frenchmen. She admired the way French women dressed, and she adopted the style very quickly. Even though in one of the portraits in which she appears alongside her husband, we can't necessarily say that what she's wearing is a Balenciaga. It was certainly influenced by Balenciaga. The search for simplicity was something that characterized her and is evident in the clothes that she wore. The ashes of Tamara de Lempica rest in the Poca Capitel volcano, and her hats, which many of them were by Balenciaga, are now in the Rodrigo Flores collection, the most important collection in Latin America, uh, the most important collection of clothes and fashion. And we had a number of different pieces by different designers. Some of the hats were in the collection in, of Rodrigo Flores, and then some of them have been sold to private collectors since. The connections between Balenciaga and Mexico don't finish there. The a woman, a famous Mexican called Trixie, wrote a number of different articles, and in fact, there were many Mexican women who appeared in fashion magazines alongside Balenciaga. Maite y Bibiñe Bella Seguigoitia accumulated a collection of approximately 50 Balenciaga dresses, which were made between 1940 and 1960. Part of the correspondence which they exchanged with the Aesa House are conserved or kept today in the historic archives of the Torreón Latin American University, including a carter, uh, uh, sorry, a letter addressed to Miss. Bella Sugoitia, in which she is informed that this will be the last year that a Balenciaga collection will be coming out because he is going to retire. Francisco Esis de Casa y Beña uh, was born in the Caribbean, by the way. The connection between Mexico and Spain enables us to identify many aspects of the legacy of Balenciaga among us. In his philosophy, many of us has found a method that we would do well to follow. And an example that sometimes we follow, sometimes we use to break away from as something to bang our heads against. But we can safely say that Balenciaga has defined, to a large extent, a large part of our world of fashion design. Like Balenciaga, sometimes we use innovation and fantastic shapes, things that challenge us. And like in other parts of the world, what we can see in his work as an artist and a designer enable us to rethink our own creative processes. The exhibition, the Cristobal Balenciaga exhibition in Mexico City has enabled us to open up an avenue of research which seemed almost impossible until very, very recent, recently. History is neither static nor immovable. Sometimes it wakes, it awakes and it moves around to enable us to construct new narratives. And in this case, the relationship between Balenciaga and Mexico, there's still a lot to be discovered about it. So we can say that like everything that Balenciaga built around himself, his connection with Mexico is also still very much a secret. I would like to thank the invaluable contribution of all of those who have helped me in this piece of research. Anna Elena Malet, Renato Camillo Duque, Rodrigo Flores, Janet Klein, Blanca Alamo, Ximena Barboglio, Mura, 
Mira Pérez Román, Fernando Toledo, Reforma Moda, The Torreón, Latin American University and the Janet Klein University. Thank you very much indeed. Preciosa última reflexión, Guillermo. What a lovely Lista thought to end that uh, presentation. Liz Traganza, the floor is all yours. Sorry, I'm just trying to get it to uh, come up. Slideshow, like from start. There we go. Cristobal Balenciaga is widely recognized as one of the leading 20th century couturiers. His dynamic designs redefined fashionable silhouettes internationally. This paper will consider the impact of his designs in Britain, focusing upon how London wholesale couturiers copied, adapted, and took inspiration from his garments. Wholesale couturiers existed at the very pinnacle of the British ready-to-wear trade and produced exclusive ready-to-wear garments manufactured in standardized sizes. The majority of their output was copied or adapted from Parisian couture. However, these designs were modified to meet ready-to-wear manufacturing techniques in Britain. Such firms focused on high quality production, using the best quality uh, fabrics available and with hand finished details. Wholesale couture pieces were produced in fairly large numbers and many garments exceeded runs of 500 pieces. As such, garments by these firms do survive and provide a glimpse into how Parisian couture was consumed by the general public. Despite the fact these pieces were copied, there was still undeniably a prestige associated with them, seen as couture modified to fit the lives of middle-class women internationally. Copying Parisian couture must be regarded as a complex process and required excellent design skills and a photographic memory. London wholesale couturiers typically travel to Paris between two and four times a year in order to view the collections. Balenciaga was amongst the Parisian couturiers favoured for copying by London wholesale couturiers. In the early 1950s, Parisian couturiers charged around £200 for London wholesalers to view their shows. Balenciaga's general fee to wholesalers was, however, higher than any other Parisian couturier at the time, and it cost £1,000 to view a Balenciaga show. Maureen Williamson argued that Balenciaga could charge this because, quote, he is the arbiter of world fashion. He can afford to play hard to get, for as he is always in the avant-garde, it is imperative for any high fashion house to know what he is up to. This entrance fee operated as the deposit against the purchase of models, toiles, quarter scale models or paper patterns. In terms of Balenciaga, it was advantageous for wholesalers to buy the original model as the construction of his garments was typically so complex. As fashion journalist Felicity Green suggested, trying to copy a Balenciaga garment without an actual pattern is like trying to knit a fair isle sweater in the dark. Typically, London Hull Secretaries produced at least one line for line copy, a garment almost indistinguishable from the original. In 1959, Iris Ashley suggested, in many cases, you would have to see the original French model alongside the British version before you could be sure of the difference. Even then, it is only a matter of the fullness in the underskirts, the material of the dress being identical, like perhaps the example you can see here. Later, she provided an exact clear example of such copying um, in, again in the Daily Mail. She suggested Mr. Cooper's Dean of Coopy, who pays around £2,000 each season to buy from Balenciaga, brings home each year three or four original suits, coats and dresses. This season, he bought back a black short evening dress in Secker Wall Chevron. The identical dress in the same fabric will sell for less than a tenth of the original. Ashley does describe these dresses as identical, although there would certainly have been differences between the, the, uh, the Paris couture pieces and the wholesale copies. Um, on the exterior, they appear to be the same, but the difference would have been on with the interior construction and also because of the fact that wholesale couture pieces were made up in standardized sizes. 
Um, one thing that it is really important to note is that a lot of London wholesale couturiers were producing garments in the same fabric as the as the um, Parisian oak couturiers were. Prices for copies of Parisian designs made in London vary dramatically, depending on the manufacturer, the fabric, and the number of garments produced. Understandably, more expensive wholesale couture models bore closer resemblance to the Paris originals. In Britain, daywear copies by London wholesale couturiers typically retailed at under 20 guineas. Copies of evening wear were often priced between 30 and 60 guineas. Many of those garments priced over 30 guineas were made up using the original fabrics. Um, in, in the article that you can see on screen from uh, November 1958, there were two dresses which featured in Harper's Bazaar, which are both very clearly influenced by this Balenciaga silhouette that you can see. <coughs> Um, the Coupe dress, which is seen in the background, was priced at 32 guineas, and the Frederick Stark dress in the foreground was pr um, priced at 38 guineas. The Frederick Stark one was made up in bronze satin uh, by Abraham of Zurich, which was one of the manufacturers that um, Balenciaga uh, worked with the most, so it can be assumed this was a pretty exact copy. Line-for-line -line copies were a key feature of wholesalers' production. However, each design purchase was expected to be adapted into more than one garment, with some firms expecting to get around eight to ten derivatives from each model they purchased and then reproduce each of these 400 to 500 times. It should be also be noted that aside from buying these original models, that wholesale couturiers would quite often copy models from memory if it was at all possible. Balenciaga was widely admired by London wholesale couturiers and Anne Gibbs, um, Jean Allen and Frederick Stark all regarded him as their favourite couturier. However, this predilection for Balenciaga must be considered in the context of his prohibitively expensive shows and the complexity of his designs. Certainly, it was challenging to correctly copy a Balenciaga um, garment so that the original silhouette was not diluted. There were many reasons why wholesalers copied and adapted Balenciaga's designs. Gibbs suggested, quote, buy a coat from him and you've got a fashionable line for years. I'm still running one that I bought from him five years ago. I can't drop it. People keep asking for it. Stark agreed, suggesting that he was drawn to Balenciaga's designs because, quote, he doesn't make a violent change every six months. It's an evolution. Furthermore, wholesalers unquestionably copied Balenciaga because his designs um, were considered ahead of the fashionable silhouette. A number of articles indicating that he was between up to three years ahead of the current silhouette. One of Balenciaga's most copied designs was the sack, seen here. Um, however, this was amongst his most controversial. Uh, I do enjoy the joke in this Irish Ashley um, article about can you spot the maternity dress. Um, Angela Regis suggested that never has have a fashion been so widely copied, discussed, admired and criticised as the sack. The sack did not win favour with department store buyers in Britain, um, who were wholesale couturier's main customers. It was challenging to get these buyers to purchase copies of Balenciaga garments, which hung loosely from the body, creating shapes of their own, rather than tightly hugging the body of the wearer. In the late 1950s, it was still, particularly outside of London, the Dior New Look silhouette that was preferred with fitted waist and full or pencil, sim, um, pencil slim skirt. Catherine Whitehorn suggested that it was, quote, waist not, want not in the provinces. One of the most faithful copies of a Balenciaga... <clears throat> Um, was produced by, uh, was of the woolen sack, sorry, was produced by Frederick Stark, seen here. Apart from the colour, this dress appears to be identical uh, to a Balenciaga wool sack dress held um, from 1957, held by the Museo Cristobal Balenciaga. One of the most accurate details of this dress is the curved yoke that runs around the back of the dress. This ensures that the dress stands away from the body as the original Balenciaga does. Um, this same Queen article, so these are two halves of the same of the same page, except effectively, um, also featured another Balenciaga-inspired dress by uh, by Stark, a quote loose uh, black lace shift over a fitted black taffet taffeta sheath, caught just below the knee with a ribbon. 
This garment is very clearly copied from a Balenciaga, um, uh, Balenciaga garment that was featured in the Autumn Winter 1957 collection. A photograph of this Balenciaga dress appeared in Harper's Bazaar. Um, this article describes the dress as a, quote, straight chemise of deep black marisco lace over a fitted undersheath caught low with a bow. From the photographs of the dress, it is difficult to tell how precise the copy was. However, it appears that the Balenciaga version was made from a much denser lace. The silhouette, though, is still very similar. The Stark version has a slight flounce to the hem, and the Balenciaga dress does not. However, this difference may be because the Balenciaga lace used was heavier and did not sit in the same way. This Stark uh, version of the Balenciaga dress was priced at 19 and a half guineas, and this was a fairly low price for an evening wear copy um, by Stark. Um, and I, I'm going to assume that it was priced so low because it was not uh, produced in the same fabric. Another popular Balenciaga silhouette for copying was the baby doll, which first appeared in 1957. This example uh, seen on um, seen here uh, has a black crepe transparent uh, black lace. Um, sorry, this example seen here has a black, black crepe de chine fitted sheath underdress with a short sleeved semi transparent black lace baby doll dress over the top. The dress is wide and flared, creating a trapeze shape with a low waist, um, um, and it has a gathered skirt made up of at least two layers of lace. The dress is accented with a large satin bow on both the drop waistline and at the neckline. This dress is a clear example of Balenciaga's experimentation with shape and body proportions. And there is a playfulness to the combination of a skin tight underdress and a very loose voluminous overdress. In April 1958, Frank Usher's adaptation of this Balenciaga dress was featured in Harper's Bazaar. This dress, like Balenciaga's, features a tightly fitted black sheath underdress. However, in the Frank Usher example, the overdress is strapless, described as a curtain of dotted net. This dress again has the drop waistline and features an accent bow detail. However, the bow appears to be on the sheath of the Frank Usher example rather than on the overdress overdress. Whilst this still is an effective design, it's not quite so dramatic as the Balenciaga original. Another Balenciaga baby doll um, was made from ivory silk taffeta seen here with a pink and red um, floral, um, floral print. Uh, Frederick Stark made at least two kind of copies or adaptations of this design in his um, Autumn Winter 1958 collection. Uh, the oyster satin dress um, seen in the middle is embroidered with gold leaves and the fabric used here was designed by Montex of Paris, um, who were one of the uh, leading producers of embroidered textiles in Paris at the time. Um, the coat seen on, uh, also seen here um, has a similar silhouette, but actually the waist seen here is dropped even lower than in the Balenciaga example. Um, this coat is made from a ribbed silk in, um, in sapphire grey and black and was produced by Abrahams of Zurich. Leslie Miller has suggested that Abrahams was one of Balenciaga's closest collaborators, so we can assume again this is probably using the same fabrics as being seen in Paris. Uh, Stark's coat seen here was priced at £52 and his evening dress at 54 guineas. Both garments significantly higher in price than the lace dress that I showed previously. This demonstrates the uplift in prices um, of wholesale couture garments when fabrics were similar or perhaps identical to those used by the couturiers. Neither article here, interestingly, actually suggests that these pieces are copied from or adapted from Balenciaga. However, the influence certainly visually is very clear. Um, these examples, I will say, they do follow Balenciaga's overall lines, but they aren't complete uh, total copies. They're more adaptations. Interestingly, neither takes on the bow details that the Balenciaga does. And this is actually likely uh, due to Stark's own preferences. And he really liked kind of simplicity in design. And I assume just wanted to take the bow, the bow element off, basically. Um, whilst the examples that I've shown on this slide are very similar adaptations, um, it's also it's also was seen that actually the there are slightly more kind of nuanced, uh, um, less close, I would say, adaptations of Balenciaga's designs seen in the London Wholesale Couture collections. Um, so quite often you see um, kind of Spanish influences in particular as being described as being copied or adapted from Balenciaga. Uh, things like flamenco hems, pom-poms and black lace, or in the choice of colours. Um, so um, following Balenciaga's preference for brown, black and bright highlights of shocking pink. 
Um, overall, I would say it's much easier to trace how wholesale couture is copied and adapted um, the evening Balenciaga's evening wear. wear. However, magazine articles are testament to London wholesale couture is adapting Balenciaga's silhouettes for day two. Um, one uh, Stark suit, which is featured in the Irish Ashley article seen here, um, was described as follows. These are not identical copies from the Paris collections, but each one is unmistakably influenced by the very latest news from the French capital. We have reported to you here from Paris a suit of which the jacket is moulded to the body in the front and hangs straight at the back. Here you see London's versions on these, the on these themes. Often these day wear examples are harder to identify, um, but, but certainly the influence of Balenciaga's can be seen in wholesale couture collections of day dresses, suits and coats throughout the 1950s and 60s. Uh, between the 1940s and 1960s, the British fashion press repeatedly highlighted the significance of London wholesale couture to the British public, demonstrating that it was through them that the Parisian uh, couture aesthetic was consumed. For example, Joy Matthews suggested in 1958 that, quote, I've been talking to the people who matter as much to you as the Paris designers, the people who between them produce millions of coats, dresses, suits and skirts every year in Great Britain. The clothes that are sold in the shops all over the country, the clothes that you wear, whatever the Paris geniuses have in store for us this spring, it is what these men and women buy, what catches their eye, what they, what they like or dislike that shapes your fashion future. This quote must be understood in the context of the dominance of Parisian fashion in the 1950s, whereby lines were dictated from Paris each season. For this reason, a good adaptation of a Paris original carried a capital of its own, demonstrating that the wearer was knowledgeable about the latest silhouettes from Paris. Fashion magazines and newspapers, as you can see in this presentation, enthusiastically included the copies of um, adaptations of London wholesale couturiers within their pages. Sometimes articles made clear that such garments were copies of Paris originals with article headlines such as from Paris to your local shop and hints for ensuring haute couture at your price. Whilst other editorial pieces did not mention the Paris origins of the design in either the headline or the copy. Those articles that do make clear that garments were copied and adapted from Parisian originals use interesting language to do so. Garments were described as inspired by, adaptations copied, or even from the Balenciaga collection. Some press articles also described wholesale couture copies as being after a certain designer. This term after uh, unquestionably borrows from the lexicon typically associated with art, and it is, illustrates that the garment is a copy, while also indicating perhaps the artistry of the, of the Parisian couture piece, and that sometimes Parisian couture was seen as an art form. Despite how often these copies are uh, featured, um, these copies featured in the press, and I have shown just a tiny selection of the examples I've found, um, many of these magazine featured um, uh, copies of Parisian couture were not destined to make it into the British shops. Often, the more outlandish designs, particularly, and I'll click back a slide few slides here. Often the more outland uh, outlandish designs, and particularly those copied Bal from Balenciaga, did not sell well with store buyers. Um, this was because they, uh, particularly outside London, they were unwilling to take the risks and stock high fashion pieces. This risk adverseness of buyers was best demonstrated by Catherine Whitehorn in The Spectator in 1959. She stated, quote, the press, seeing some gay little number in pink swans down with orange spots, gleefully photographs it, only to find that outside Soho there is not a single shop in which their readers can buy it. The buyers, having bought their usual quota of 100 beige classics, 100 maroon classics and 500 black outsizes with perhaps one fashionable dress to put in the window, are furious when a magazine illustration sends dozens of customers into the shop clamouring for the fashionable one. They then order the dress in quantity, but by the time it arrives, the magazines are onto something else. The question must therefore be asked, why were, why were buyers not willing to take risks? Of course, there was a financial issue of buying something different that they were not sure their customers would want to purchase. However, there was also, I think, an issue of sizing and particularly questioning how these high fashion garments would scale up for their local clientele. By the late 1950s, this was, however, beginning to change, and manufacturers were selling exact copies of Parisian couture and particularly Balenciaga's designs outside of London. 
1958, Anne Brew, head designer for Frank Usher, suggested that, quote, the approach to fashion has undergone a violent change in England in the last few years. You can sell the most extreme lines from Paris in Leeds, Manchester or Bradford without any trouble. I'd argue also that surviving garments are a testament to the limited ri uh, risks taken by many, many buyers. There were very, very few examples of surviving uh, garments of these line for line copies of wholesale couture, couture, um, wholesale couture to Parisian couture. Yet you can find an abundance of semi fitted wool dresses, for example, that show that kind of that essence of the sack dress. Um, and also, I'd argue the fact of what survives of London wholesale couture is also one of the reasons why uh, such firms have perhaps received little attention. The designs of London wholesale couturiers, regardless, must be regard. Um, sorry, the designs of London wholesale couturiers must be recognised as an essential part of the dissemination of Balenciaga's design aesthetic in the 1950s and 1960s. And for many consumers, this was the only way that they could afford a Balenciaga design. For those knowledgeable consumers who purchased the British copies, arguably there were two forms of cachet. The well-known ready-to-wear label itself was covetable, but the connection to a couture garment enhanced this further. Balenciaga was amongst the most copied um, Parisian, uh, Parisian couturiers, but his designs were exceedingly hard to copy accurately. Therefore, I argue that it's through the adaptations of Balenciaga's designs that the skill of the London wholesale couturier can also be recognised. Thank you. Muchísimas gracias, Liz Traganza. Abramos pues el turno de preguntas y comenzaremos con dos preguntas que están dirigidas a Victoria de Lorenzo. For Victoria de Lorenzo. Valeria from Madrid says, thank you very much for your talk on the suppliers of Valenciaga. It's clear that both were suppliers of woolen fabric, something which seems to suggest that the Valenciaga house would use them to make tailored garments. However, both worked with wools in different finishes. So could you tell us for which kind of garments he used those of Garig and from which he uses Agnona? Victoria, that's the question for you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So, from what I have seen, um, the garments, the type of garments would have been the same. So, suits or coats, mostly. Now, the way they were cut or the impression, like the, the um, gabardine light I've, I've shown, differed. And those suited, the patterns of the, of the garments suited the, the qualities of the fabric. So... It is, yeah, they were the same kind of garments, but different in their patterns depending on the, on the, on the characteristics of the fabrics. Gracias. La siguiente también es para usted, Victoria. Carmen desde Barcelona. Por lo que ha comentado, ambos proveedores empezaron sus negocios en plena madurez. Their businesses at the height of Balenciaga's maturity. From your research, do you have evidence of whether Balenciaga stopped buying from the wool suppliers with whom he had previously worked? Thank you. Um, I think I would have, I should research more of that certainly some he continued uh, buying fabrics from such as Rodier or Meyer uh, others I have to uh, conduct further research and see when and why did he select certain fabrics and when he did actually not um, use them Oh, 
Gracias, Victoria. Thank you very much, Victoria. The next question is for Kirsten. Anne from Paris says, the argument that Balenciaga had less presence both in the Danish press and in the Magazine du Nord due to the tastes of the customers who preferred practical, with more British influence, or more feminine uh, Dior, Balmain, fashion. That's very interesting. Without going into the criteria that would establish which fashion houses made the most feminine fashion, don't you think that Balenciaga's scarce presence in the Danish market may have influenced, may have been influenced, sorry, by the price of its licenses? From what I have read in Miller, for example, it was the most expensive, or by the fact that he would have, he would, he would select his licenses due to not having a license policy which was, was expensive as those in place at Dior or Balmain, for example. Thank you very much. Thank you for the question. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I pointed out that uh, that was why Balmain was uh, such a popular uh, fashion house because uh, it was a lower price for the Danish um, couture studios from the department stores because they knew Eric Mortensen and they had, they had a relationship with Balmain. So that was why it was cheap of them to buy models. That was why they, or one of the reasons I think why they chose uh, Balmain. But I also think that they favored the more conservative fashion. Was that a uh, question, uh, answer enough to the question? Yo creo que sí, Kirsten. Well, I think so. Muchísimas Thank you gracias. very much, Kirsten. Thank you very Las much. Indeed. The next two questions are for Guillermo. Anna from Salamanca says, Thank you very much for your talk. Could you explain the reference you made to Lolita de Lempica and her hat designed by Berenciaga for Rodrigo Flores? Was it a Mexican fashion house that sold French haute couture licenses? No, the hat uh, of the, wore, that Lolita wore, she had bought them in Spain or, or Paris, I'm not quite sure where. She lived the last past part of her life in Cuernavaca, in Mexico, and then years later, uh, Rodrigo Flores uh, bought the hats at an antique shop. Rodrigo Flores is a, a collector, and he has many, many pieces, uh, fashion pieces, both from Mexico and the international scene. And he has these Belenciaga hats, which formerly belonged to Lolita de Lempica. So the next question is also for you, Guillermo. Have you found any evidence of original Balenciagas being sold in any Mexican establishment? Um, have you ever looked at some of the, maybe the newspaper ads of the time? No. Uh, the in aim was to do that. Maybe to find some kind of evidence of this but unfortunately, because of the COVID crisis, I haven't been able to access as many archives as I wanted to. But from what I've seen so far, I understand that no uh, warehouse had a, a license. No uh, department store had a license or, or purchased garments directly from Balenciaga, as far as I can see. Some people speculate that it might be possible that certain Mexican buyers actually would go to New York to buy Balenciagas, which may be on sale in Bloomingdale's, for example, or, or even directly from Spain or Paris, but I haven't found any evidence. Another question has also just come in for you, Guillermo. Carlos from Teruel said, the, I thought... The connection between Rocheau, Bastiga and Arenas uh, was very important, but the connection between Balenciaga and Arenas, maybe it was because of his cousin, Famora y Aragón, who wore uh, many Balenciaga pieces, in, including her wedding gown. Yes, there is a connection. That's possible. Um, in uh, an interview 
uh, a telephone interview that I held with them, um, with Duque, over the telephone. She actually said that, yes, that she was through Bastidas that she found and discovered Valencia, and she discovered Valenciaga. But yes, it's an interesting, it's an interesting link, and I'm going to delve into that later on when I can, when the COVID will let me. Thank you very much. Now the next question is for Liz Tragenza. Peter from London says, thank you for your presentation. I found it very interesting. You referred to the fact that Balenciaga's sack dress was the most copied in England compared to others designs of his. However, you also said that it was highly controversial because it didn't have a defined waistline. Could it have been a success because it was apparently easier to copy and therefore easier to transfer to mass production? Or do you think there was another reason for this? Thank you very much. Certainly, like it was, it was a very easy thing to um, to copy. And actually, this was something I originally had in the presentation and took out of it. There was... Um, because there was a lot of uh, sort of uh, things in the, going on in the press where, where basically um, sort of London wholesale couture designers were getting really annoyed at the mass pro at the those producing uh, mass producing it because they were apparently putting two bits of fabric together and saying it was a sack. So it was it was being adapted quite badly um, by those manufacturers kind of lower down the scale, and that's also one of the reasons why it received some bad press, I suppose, because of because of how it was being adapted. Um, but it was, you know, intrinsically it was a very simple design. But to get it right, you really, I think, had to probably have the original Balenciaga in your in your hands, to not just make it look like some like like an actual sack, basically. So yeah. Thank you very much, Liz. The next question is for Kirsten. This relationship, this visual relationship that you've established uh, between Balenciaga and the Danish decorative aesthetic, which is so popular at the moment as well, what aspects do you think they're most related in? What are the aspects in which they're most similar? Is it this pure minimalism that we can find in both? Is it, is it that minimalism that makes them both timeless? Hmm. Oh, that's a, that's a huge question, which is very difficult to answer. But um, and it's a very difficult question for a Danish person to answer because it's a part of of how I grew up, what I'm used to. But of course, I think that that's a very important uh, factor. This minimalism. Um, I think the. Um, the craftsmanship is a very important thing as well. Um, this about working with the with the craft, uh, which also aligns uh, Balenciaga and Danish design, or modernist design, modernistic design. What can I say? It's also very Japanese. Uh, this minimalistic. Uh, um, style so um, you find it uh, many places in the world in applied art um, and um, it returns to, to to be in fashion uh, with a certain uh, within a certain period Thank you very much, Kirsten. The next question is for Victoria de Lorenzo. And it's sent by Evandro from Brazil. And he says, bearing in mind that in the 1930s, synthetic fabrics started to be developed, do you know anything about how Balenciaga viewed these new textile possibilities or the opportunities offered by these new textiles? Yes, thank you. Uh, Balenciaga acquired textiles that were made in synthetics. Into thirties or into mid thirties, it was also due to the lack of uh, silk because of the war. But we can see them increasingly more and more during the sixties because they became um, popular and. 
So what were his views since in Pertex? Certainly he used them in the 1960s. So I can't sell, I can't say his personal views, but he used them. Not as much as he would use others, but yes, he used them. Thank you very much. The next question is for Liz Tragenza from Amanda, who lives in Michigan from in the USA. And she says, I really enjoyed your talk uh, this morning. In fact, just this morning, I was looking at Erdem's SS21 collection and saw at least one sack back style. Are you seeing much of Balenciaga in British fashion today? Thank you. Um, <laughs> it depends whether you're talking about contemporary Balenciaga or historic Balenciaga there, because uh, like obviously contemporary Balenciaga is one of the kind of most copied. Cop um, but historically, I think there's a lot that can be said about um, Balenciaga silhouettes and about this whole kind of idea about things that kind of stand away from the body. Um, and I think that kind of fits in with a lot of um, the kind of ideas around modest fashion and things like that and how you can perhaps adapt that to things that aren't like so closely fitted, like with things like potentially sort of the idea of the sack and some of like the more loose trapeze shapes as well um so like I think last summer there was a lot of the kind of the loose uh, I can't really do it, like the loose kind of tiered trapeze shapes that were all kind of really in fashion that were definitely uh sort of looking back at that kind of late 1950s uh Balenciaga silhouette I mean I think really his designs have been looked at and kind of reinterpreted so many times um there is something that is ultimately very timeless about Balenciaga's uh design aesthetic particularly I think from the late 1950s thank you very much Liz and this next question is also for you Irene from Valencia asks you what do you think Balenciaga's creative design was like what do I think Balenciaga's creative design was like? I'm not really sure um, how 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 best to answer that that question. Um, I mean, I think he was an incredibly creative uh, designer, um, but yeah, I'm not really not really quite sure what that question is trying to trying to get at. I'm afraid. And this last one is for you. It's from Ma from Toronto, and she says, Liz. Now, you've said that it was very expensive to go to a Balenciaga show. So what was the relationship between Balenciaga and the mass producers in Britain when they came to try to buy haute couture pieces? What was the relationship like? Um, well, as there's there's not very much documented, particularly about Balenciaga's relationship. I mean, the one thing to say is that of any of the couturiers in Paris, Balenciaga sort of had a bit of more of a difficult relationship, I think, with the whole idea of being copied. Like it was kind of the more of the artistry element of it, from what I what I'm aware of. And um, this is as well why Balenciaga isn't strictly speaking a couturier because he was never a member of the Chambray Chambray. Syndical. Um, and that, you know, he sits slightly outside of he sits slightly outside of the calendar and everything like that. So that's why I think it was certainly for for London wholesale couturiers, there was a certain level of cachet and excitement about being able to go and see a Balenciaga show. You because he showed uh, typically slightly later, you would have had to have gone to Paris, come back to London, then gone back to Paris again to go and show, see his shows, probably. Um, unless you had the sort of the staff to be able to stay out there and, and see them. Um, and also, you know, it's prohibitively expensive. But I think from from what I've read, from what the whole secretaries have, have, have set, uh, uh, were saying at the time, it was always that they really liked Balenciaga's designs and that he was sort of who they really wanted to copy and saw as really kind of, it was it was worth copying. But in I don't think any of the actual, like the Parisian couturiers had a particular relationship with the wholesale couturiers, I think you have the kind of the middlemen is more about the kind of um, is sort of like the press, and then you have the kind of uh, oh my god, the name is the vendrenduces uh, in the um, Parisian salons as well, who are going to deal with that kind of relationship. You don't have like a a face to face relationship, I think, um, if that makes sense. Thanks. Thank you very much, Liz. The next and last question 
is for Guillermo. Elda says, is there information uh, about uh, of any First Lady of Mexico wearing Balenciaga? Do you have any information about that? Sorry, I had my mic muted. Not that I know of. For a certain amount of time, the First Ladies, they used to wear Mexican designers. But I think that perhaps this is worth researching. Perhaps between 1940s, 1950s, I don't know if one of them may have acquired a Valenciaga. I don't know. It would be worth researching. I don't know, maybe for her personal life or, or, or for a public event, indeed. Something worth investigating. Thank you very much. Thank you to all four of you, Victoria, Kirsten, Guillermo and Liz. It's been wonderful to have all of you with us this afternoon. Thank you very much indeed. Now we're going to have a short break. It's uh, a quarter to five here in Getaria, Spanish time. So we'll be back at five o'clock, so in 15 minutes. Thank you very much. Buenas tardes. Abrimos el cuarto y último bloque de este Congreso. Fourth panel in this conference, which is called Balenciaga Creator, Technical and Aesthetic Aspects. Experts who studied the work of Balenciaga highlight his technical complexity and come inside in claiming that it's this complexity which underpins the so-called Balenciaga style. In this panel, we're going to analyze the specific aspects of this binomial technique and aesthetics. And to talk about it, we have Ruth Valentin from San Sebastian, Alistair O'Neill from London, Thessa Rodriguez from Amsterdam, Nadia Albertini from Paris, Berta Pavlov from uh, Ontario, and we also have Sergio Roman and Ana Santa Maria from Burgos. Ruth Valentin is a cons uh, conservator at the Cristobal Balenciaga Museum. And she's going to be talking about 1927, a wedding dress attributed to Cristobal Valenciaga. Alastair O'Neill is Professor of Fashion History and Theory at Central St. Martins of London. And his talk is called Exploding Fashion, Cutting, Constructing and Thinking Through Things. Thessa Rodriguez Salinas is Head of the Fashion and Textile Conservation Department at Kunstmuseum de Den Haag of the Netherlands. And she's going to be, he's going to be talking with Nadia Albertini, who is an embroidery designer and a writer based in Paris. And their talk is entitled Study and Material Characterization of the Embroidery Threads Presented at the Bolero Jacket Le Percé. Berta Pavlov is a professional pattern maker and technical illustrator. She's also a professor at the George Brown College of the Centre for Arts and Design and Information Technology in Toronto, Canada, and the department is a departmental associate of the textile section of the Department of Art and Culture, Royal Ontario Museum in Canada. And her talk is called Cristobal Balenciaga, Master of Geometric Design. Ana Santa Maria is Assistant Professor at the University Rey Juan Carlos of Madrid. She teaches history of fashion design and art history uh, on the design and fashion management, integral design and image management and landscaping degrees. She is going to be talking with Sergio Roman, who's an assistant professor at the University of Rey Juan Carlos in Madrid, where he teaches art history. He has a PhD in art history from the Complutense University of Madrid. And their talk is entitled Intuition Beyond Japanism, Balenciaga's Relationship with is the aesthetics of emptiness. At the end of this last talk, uh, given by Anna and Sergio, we will again have a Q&A session. And please remember that you can send your questions to congress at fbalenciaga.com. So without further ado, I will pass the floor to Ruth Valentin. Good afternoon. First of all, I would like to thank the scientific committee at the Cristobal Balenciaga Museum for accepting my proposal and also the restoration service at the Alaba Provincial Council for their collaboration. 
Doy comienzo a mi ponencia, titulada 1927, un vestido... My talk is entitled 1927, a bridal gown or a wedding dress attributed to Cristobal Valenciaga. The museum in Guetaria holds many of the creations made by Valenciaga. In 2005, the museum received a donation of pieces from his early years as a couturier. We have a number of uh, different pieces of clothing and some photographs. And here we can see three of the pieces of clothing that were donated. The, the pieces of clothing belong to the aunt of the person who donated them to the museum. I started my research at the museum and I focused on the central uh, photograph, which there was no label, but I could see some similarities with other photographs found from the same era. In the middle, we can see the original, and then we can, on the right, we can see Maria uh, Picaba Echevaria uh, on the right, wearing a very similar dress. There's also another uh, portrait of Carmen Picabia, who's the mother of the donor, wearing uh, a white dress with a floral design, attributed to Valenciaga. Later on, uh, it was confirmed that it was, in fact, a Valenciaga. Given these results, we decided to carry out um, a piece of research to investigate or to determine whether the fourth uh, dress that had been donated was in fact a Balenciaga or not. It was a wedding dress. Uh, there was no photographs of it and there was no label. The first thing we had to do to start this piece of research into this wedding gown was to improve it, to restore it, because it was in a very, very poor state of conservation. Now I'm going to show you a short video and uh, you are going to, you're going to be able to see part of the treatment that was carried out on the dress and uh, the state of conservation in which it was at the beginning of the research project. You can see that they were in separate pieces and there were a lot of um, sequins that had come loose. So a previous sketch was made for the pattern to enable us to reconstruct it. The whole of the intervention was based on minimum degree of intervention and total respect for the piece. So we gradually added the missing pieces, the left sleeve, for example, in order to be able to interpret the dress properly. In order to reinforce all of this, we decided to identify the materials. And to do that, we had the help of the restoration service run by the Alaba Provincial Council in the Basque Country. The results confirm that the material is silk. And if we looked, when we looked at the sequins, we thought they were metal, and in fact the results confirm that. All the sequins are made from copper. They have a silver uh, covering, and then there's varnish on top to avoid the metal rusting. And uh, thanks to that, they have been, they've been conserved over the years. The, analyst, the analysis uh, has also really helped us and will help us in future research. And the analysis confirmed the quality of the material, which is of very, very high quality. So we have a uh, dress with very straight, pure lines 
with silver-coated sequins. Uh, something very, very typical of the haute couture at the time. It's now on display. And in fact, it's on display at the moment in the current exhibition at the Cristobal Valenciaga Museum. After carrying out all the treatment, we then looked for historical information, uh, looking at the different trends that were around at the time. Now, we know that from 1918 onwards, uh, he did come up with a number of different designs for wedding gowns. And this helps reinforce the idea that this model, maybe it was uh, either purchased or it might have been his own creation. But there is an important Parisian influence in the dress. We, can, we found a lot of similar similarities. Uh, here we can see the model of uh, 1926 by Jean Badou, which you can see on the right-hand side in the fall of the shoulders, for example. This is very similar to the restored dress, uh, but the skirt is quite different. Now, using the results of the, the, the bias cut skirt that we found, thanks to the results of our research, we saw that this was, in fact, something very common. Uh, and, in fact, perhaps Jean Pateau might have had an influence on the design. We also looked in Paris eh, among the workbooks and notebooks of Madeleine Bionnet in the 1920s. Here we can see a number of different models. You can see different... Uh, there's one model here from 1926. You can see that there's a lot of similarities, especially around the waist. And here's another model from the same year where there's a lot of similarities as well. There's a crossed back. So this is very similar in style to the dress that we were researching. We know that Balenciaga had a commercial, a commercial relationship with Madeleine Bionet. And thanks to the research carried out by the museum, we know that in 1927, uh, Balenciaga went to actually visit Bionet to look at the models there. And uh, we don't know whether this influenced the dress that we have here. But among, in the notebook, we see a model uh, which is very similar and very interesting. Uh, also, we found a picture which was published in Vogue in 1927 as well. And there you can see it's a very similar cut to the wedding dress. There's a crossover at, uh, at the waist. And also, if we look at the front part of the skirt, this is quite similar as well, which leads us to the conclusion that this was the basis for the design of the wedding dress that we have and that we restored. Now, having confirmed the influence of Bionet, what we needed to do was to just determine whether or not we were actually working with an original piece, because there was no label. Now, the uh, wedding was extremely important in Spain because she was the daughter of an important Basque politician, the lady who wore the dress at her wedding. So there was, it was reported in the press. So we looked at different newspapers published in the province of Guipúzcoa. And we know that the wedding took place in May. Uh, 1926, and here we can see articles which uh, describe the gown, the wedding gown, but none of them actually mention the creator, mention the designer. 
Now, we were lucky enough to find uh, an edition of the El Pueblo Vasco newspaper, and there we can actually see uh, a picture of the bride and groom. In this article, they quote, or they say, and I quote, the age-old question, what did the bride look like? She looked beautiful with her satin crepe bridal gown and with a Jewish veil with lace from Brussels. Total marvel, work of the maestro Valenciaga, which is underlined in red. And thanks to this article, we can attribute this creation to Cristobal Valenciaga. Therefore, the main aim of this research project was to recover a unique piece from the 1920s, uh, which has been hitherto unknown until now, and which enables us to increase and to expand the heritage that we have of Balenciaga's early years as a courtier, of which very few examples still exist. The study has enabled us to discover the the incredibly high quality of the materials. And we can see the clear influence of Madeleine Bionet in one of the creations by Valenciaga. And we can also confirm uh, that uh, he was, in fact, the creator of this design, thanks to our research in old newspapers. So we can say, we can affirm that we, what we have here is a unique piece because it is in fact the oldest dress that we still have made by the Balenciaga Fashion House. It's and that concludes my presentation. Thank you all very much for listening. And as we say in the Basque language, es que ricasco. Thank you very much, Ruth Valentin. Now we're going to pass on now to Nadia Albertini and Cesar Rodriguez. Dual study we carried out on one of the bolero jackets that Cristobal Balenciaga designed in Paris in 1946. I will present to you the historical and design aspect of this research. We'd like to mention, however, that due to the extension of this paper, we will only be able to share a portion of it during this presentation. As you can imagine, a lot has been said about the bolero jackets designed by Balenciaga. However, we realized that many interesting aspects of these pieces had not been discussed yet, such as the origin of the embroidery and the quality of the materials involved. Different questions were raised before starting our research who designed and supplied the embroidery for Balenciaga? Why has it been wrongly attributed to Lesage for so long? And what are the reasons for the degradation processes we observe on the sequins and other materials, for example? The jacket we have chosen to study was gifted to the Kunstmuseum in The Hague by the famous opera singer Elsa Riekens. You can see her here on the image on the left, wearing the jacket in 1947. By their beauty and historical relevance, three other repetitions of the jacket are carefully preserved in two other museums. Two are at the Museo Balenciaga in Getaria, and another one is at the Museo del Traje in Madrid. The four items have identical embroideries, but the one in the Museo del Traje has a completely different construction, as you can see on the bottom image. Note how the sleeves and the front panels are different from the other two. This piece is part of an ensemble number 113 and accompanies a long black dress worn with black gloves. 
Though he worked throughout the war, this was the first collection shown by Balenciaga after the German defeat. In order to understand the uniqueness of this piece, we need to keep in mind it was created in the fall of 1945, a, a moment in history that was particularly difficult in Paris. Massive material shortages were still in place after the war and fashion suffered from them. Designers and haute couture suppliers had to double their efforts and creativity to get around these restrictions. The front fabric is ivory silk satin and the back is black crepe. As you can see, only the front and the lapels are embroidered. Could this be explained by the material shortages of, or was it a this design decision made by Balenciaga? This piece is one of the various short jackets or boleros from the 1946 summer collection. They often accompany long dresses, as you can see on the first two sketches on the left. Balenciaga reminiscence of Spain appears not only through their shape, but also through their rich embroideries, as we can see on the third picture. They add a touch of color and light to the slim and austere silhouette. This jacket set the tone for what would become a particularly famous season for Balenciaga, the fall-winter 1946 collection. With Balenciaga's take on the bull's fire jacket, heavily embellished with jet stones and black passementerie. For years, catalogues and museum records have indicated that Le Sage Ateliers did the embroidery on our jacket, but this information is incorrect. And through this research, we have been able to find the right source for the beautiful embellishment. Le Sage gained great fame from the 1960s on, and this has, a very, has had a very good impact on French embroidery, but had also the negative effect of over, overshadowing all the other embroidery ateliers of the time. This was the case for Rebe, which was considered the best embroidery atelier in Paris from 1907 to 1967. This atelier was managed by a couple that you can see here on this image, René Beguet on the right and his wife André on the left, discussing a preparatory sketch. They've both designed and were deeply involved in the whole process. René was responsible of the drawing department and André was responsible of the embroidery department. Their clients included Worth, Paquin, Poiré, Drecol and Membauché before the, the 1939, before the war. And after the war, Christian Dior and Roger Vivier became one, some of their best clients, as were Balenciaga, Saint Laurent, and Givenchy. René Beguet and his wife were known for their exquisite drawings and their perfect knowledge of garment construction. This helped them creating seamless embroidered looks where the embellishment is perfectly adapted to the shape of each garment. Constant new research led them to interpret all techniques with new and innovative materials. Here are some examples of their work. On the left, you can see a sample used by Roger Vivier on shoes in 1963. And on the right, you can see a beautiful embroidered sample that Saint Laurent used for one of his jackets also in 1963. After retiring from fashion and with having a proper heir, René Beguet knew that the only way of preserving their life's work was to donate all his samples to public institutions in France. So from 1970 to 1984, he gave more than 5,000 samples to five different museums. Rebe was probably introduced to Balenciaga by one of his other clients, designer Maggie Roof. Balenciaga's first important order is this jacket from 46, but their collaboration would last till 1967 when Rebe closed his business. Together and during those 20 years, they created more than 120 embroidered styles. Balenciaga first liked the black passementeries and jet embroideries in the 40s. 
to move to more textured surfaces in the 50s, as we can see with this white image from the MFA in Boston. Later, during the 60s, they experimented with more abstract designs using diverse sequence plastics and hodoid sheets, as well as crystals and beads. This research took us to visit Les Arts Décoratifs archives in Paris, where the museum keeps more than 600 of the Rebe samples. On the right, we can see an embroidery sample from the mid 30s. This was a starting point for our jacket. Having been closed during the war years, Rebe didn't have a, a collection ready in the fall of 1945. So he had no choice but to show some of his old work dating from before the war to Balenciaga. The image on the left shows us a waistcoat from the last quarter of the 19th century. Rebe used to keep antique samples of embroidery as technical references for new creations. We see how this is an old piece and a 200 year old technique is modernized by Rebe. They added padding under the chenille to make it more dimensional on our jacket and also use sequins and seed beads to add a touch of light. Another major source of information at the Musée des Arts Décoratifs Archive are the design books, where Rebe kept records of all their poncif. A poncif is the drawing and it's the name of the drawing given to the sketch that is transferred onto the fabric to be then embroidered. The left image shows you um, a detail of the jacket. And if you compare it with the central image, which is the poncif, we can very easily identify the exact same motives um, on both pieces. This was the main element that helped us confirm that this jacket was indeed embroidered by Rebe and not by Le Sage. We noticed the presence of cashmere or paisley motifs. Rebe was inspired by 17th century Iranian rugs, of which we have found images in his archive at the, at the Rabastans Museum. But the request for these motifs, these paisley motifs, might ha also have come from Balenciaga himself. On the right, you can see a burnus from his personal collection gifted by his family to the Palais Galliera after his death. As Cesar will explain to you later, the materials used for the embroidery are not luxurious nor expensive. Yet the piece is stunning and it's important enough to have been preserved not only by one client of Monsieur Balenciaga, but by four of his clients, and then gifted to some of the best fashion museums in the world. Here, the beauty comes in a large portion from the embroidery craftsmanship. This embellishment process hasn't changed much since the Middle Ages. And even today in 2020, we still follow the exact same method. You can see on these images the different steps we go through during the embroidery process. Uh, once the poncif is drawn, we have to prick it with an electric machine that you can see on the top left. Then, using a poncet, we do the pouncing process to transfer the poncif onto the fabric. And then the fabric is mounted on what we call a slate frame, a square-shaped frame. And only then the embroidery can start. There's another important piece at the Mad collection that confirmed Rebe provided this embroidery to Balenciaga in 1946. It's an identical duplicate of the left front panel of the jacket. We clearly identify it by the leaves and the motifs of the flowers on the knotted part of the front of the jacket. We find the exact embroidery done on the exact same silk satin, and the panel carries a label that was probably shown there by the Balenciaga workrooms. The tag contains the name of Balenciaga, the style number 113, and the name of the chef d'atelier who was responsible for this style. This is how all panels were prepared and are still prepared by all the haute couture ateliers before they send it to us in the embroidery ateliers. This panel might have been a cancel repetition 
or an embroidery with the floor that Rebet decided to keep in his archive after 1946 and then he donated to the Musée des Arts Décoratifs in 1970. Thank you very much. And now I ask you to please welcome my colleague Cesar, who will share his part of the research with you. Thanks, Nadia. Uh, my name is Cesar Rodriguez Salinas and I am the Fashion and Textile Conservator from the Kunstmuseum in The Hague. I am going to follow this research, presenting to all of you the scientific techniques that has been carried out during this study in order to quantify and qualify the different material aspects involved at the jacket. Those analyses serve us to understand more closely the moment when the jacket was created, the way those materials were applied, or even how they have been evolved along the years. This process was separated in two stages. The first one, named non-destructive phase, was focused on the study of the embroidery motifs by different light sources and microscope techniques. This was followed by a second stage named destructive test phase, where samples were collected for further analysis in different external institutions. We would like, however, to take into consideration that this is only a brief result of the analysis that has been carried out into the sequence and the chain of threads. For further knowledge, we encourage all of you to read the whole research once it is published for a completely understanding. Let's start with the first phase. Observing the embroidery flowers under the stereo microscope, it was possible to gather different information such as the embroidery technique used, especially looking under the chain of threads where the padding is. Equally, it was also possible to identify the different degradation processes presented at the jacket. The stereo microscope helped us to identify the diverse chain of threads used for filling the embroidery motifs. Those threads were used as padding, avoiding the traditional methods used by more robust material, such as thick cotton threads or even wool fibers. This padding didn't follow any pattern, since it was discovered that the same color flowers were filled by different color chain of threads. As you all could imagine, we were quite surprised because the use of chain of threads as filling just after the Second World War would have been very expensive for any embroidery atelier. The following technique use was based on the reaction of the embroidery threads exposed to the reaction of different light sources such as visible light and ultraviolet light. This is sometimes very useful technique because it helps to fashion conservators to identify different aspects such as the original marks used from the embroidery designer, as it could be seen at the right photo on this slide, pointed out by red arrows. Other times, however, those lights could be very helpful to identify the different materials used for the confection of the embroidery motifs. This is based on the reaction of the materials used exposed under the ultraviolet light reflecting different fluorescence reactions, such as the ones here visible under, at the right photos pointed out by yellow and red arrows. This is the consequence of the masterly eye of the embroidery designer that probably do a shortage of material, choose a very similar color thread that was not very visible under the normal light. This result was very crucial in our research, since it wouldn't have any logical reason of using senior threads as filling if the embroidery designer was running out of materials. The following step in this research involved sampling. This is always a very delicate process because some of the original materials from the object are necessary to be taken in order to gather the right information needed for the research. As you all could see, 
a detailed identification of the samples was made, defining the main goals that were expecting to be gathered from those analyses. The first results that were obtained were related to the sequence. Those sequences were submitted to different techniques, bringing very interesting results from the analysis of the electron microscope, here named as SEM. This technique helped us to identify the degradation components presented or even the production techniques used for its confection. This information, in combination with the other techniques, guide us to the conclusion that the sequence were made by three different layers identified as cellulose nitrate, silver, and galatite. Please note that the blue square is pointing out the degradation traces presented at the silver in form of black holes. This material would reflect a very modern production that substitutes the previously problematic sequence that were used at the beginning of the 20th century. This new plastic was a huge development before the war and it was widely used for the production of furniture, buttons, needles, or even yearly as it can be seen at this good newspaper from 1925. Even French fashion designers as Marcel Rochas claim its use for their collections as it can be read at this magazine from 1933. Unfortunately, during the Second World War, the material was banned for production and it was not recovered till the end of the war. This fact would reflect that the sequence used for the confection of this bolero jacket were collected by Rebe before the war was started and probably belongs to the same embroidery swatch made in 1930 that Nadia has previously presented to all of you. The identification of the chain of threads help us to understand the confession techniques used or even its quality. The analytical techniques identified a cotton thread for the core and a rayon viscosa for the piles. This fact would justify its use as filling, since from an economical point of view, it was not so expensive as the previously chained threads used made with itself. Through this common work, we have been able to clarify the origin of the embroidery. We can now affirm that it was made by Rebe and not by Le Chasse. Another very important observation is how, with very little resources available in 1945, and with what we can consider plain materials, Balenciaga and Rebe managed to design and produce such a beautiful piece. This research has allowed us not only to deepen in our knowledge, but it has also led us to develop a fruitful collaboration between two major European fashion institutions such as Kunstmuseum in The Hague and Museo des Arts Decoratives in Paris. We would like to wrap up this presentation by saying how interesting this experience has been for both of us, coming from two different backgrounds, countries and languages, especially during these particularly challenging COVID times. Thank you everyone for attending this presentation. Thank you very much to both Lisa and Nadia. Now we'll now be passing the floor over to Alastair O'Neill. Hello. Um, I'll begin again. I'd just like to thank the organisers and the scientific committee for inviting me to speak this afternoon. Um, this paper is a case study 
taken from a larger project that explores pattern cutting and fashion in motion in 20th century fashion history. The project is based on the transformation of two-dimensional cloth into three-dimensional form in the fashion design process and foregrounds the role of the pattern cutter, an essential maker and technician whose role is essentially unacknowledged in design histories and unfamiliar to consumers. The project reverse engineers five historical designs by game-changing fashion designers who are also innovative pattern cutters, digitally reanimating museum objects as moving images which visually narrate how these things were once made and how they once moved on the body. It responds to the limitations of researching surviving dress in the museum store, where conservation measures might prevent handling of the dress or seeing it placed on a stand. And it is informed by recent developments in fashion exhibitions, which have employed visual technologies to help illuminate construction methods of surviving dress. And on the right um, is the use of X-ray technology in the Victoria and Albert Museum's recent Balenciaga exhibition. The research team for this project consists of two professional pattern cutters, an historian, a curator, a project documenter, a project coordinator, and a digital visualization company. Uh, and the five fashion designers were selected for their innovative pattern cutting techniques and due to international dress museums holding either the extant business archive or a large collection of surviving designs and contextual material. Um, so in chronological order, the designers are Madeleine Vionnet, Charles James, Christopher Balenciaga, Halston and Ray Caracubo for Conde Garçon. And our host museum for the project was the Victorian Albert Museum in London, where much of our initial thinking for the project um, took place. Today I will focus on the Balenciaga design selected for the project, outlining the research process and the findings. The garment designs chosen for the project were selected due to them expressing a, a problem that needed resolving um, or that they had not had much research directed at them. We were also keen to focus on a design feature that a designer might have returned to as a variation in how it might be technically resolved or aesthetically deployed. From our visits to the storeroom of the Musée Galliera, introduced to us by curator Veronique Belois, we were first drawn to a cocktail dress from 1958 in black silk crepe with a rounded neckline at the front and floating back panel from the shoulder straps to create a sack back effect. Investigating the inside of the garment, something pattern cutters very much insist on, we were surprised to see the raw edges of the seam allowance, which was in contrast to the finished Balenciaga designs we had inspected at the V&A, which were all superbly finished with fine hand stitching. Close range photography on the right allowed us to document the textile construction of the crepe fabric Balenciaga used, um, allowing us to match it to a contemporary equivalent sponsored by the Italian Trade Commission in London and provided by the textile mill in Setta in Prato in northern Italy. Um, the limited contextual materials that could be drawn upon to further substantiate the design at the Galliera um, led to an introduction to the archivist at Balenciaga Paris, Gaspard de Massé, who was able to arrange a subsequent appointment for us to see a later cocktail dress design bearing a similar neckline and sack back detail. And what was useful about this model dress design on the left is in addition to the surviving dress dated February 1966, the Balenciaga archive also possesses its toile on the right dated a year earlier in black linen uh, and it's a fascinating um, set of three unstitched panel um, uh, sorry pattern pieces um, each of them 
stitched with three types of coloured thread, um, white to indicate the shape of the pattern, um, yellow to indicate the client's measurements, and uh, green um, uh, for the grain line of the fabric. Um, and this study session permitted the pattern cutters, Patrick Lee Yao and Esme Young, to measure the surviving dress, both flat and on the stand, and cross-reference the measurements and fit with the surviving twelve in order to create a paper pattern, which you can see in this film. <laughs> Test pattern pieces were then traced off the paper pattern onto spider paper a more malleable form of woven paper, which allowed for the testing of the shape of the bodice on a stand alongside the surviving dress. The session also permitted the photographic documentation of the dress and 12 by the project documenter, Liam Leslie, including a point cloud 3D rendering of the design in the storeroom uh, using an iPhone, which this short film on a loop demonstrates. A point cloud is a set of data points in space, um, generally um, taken by 3D scans, which measure many points on the external su surface of an object. Um, and it's a process uh, now commonly used for 3D printing. Um, and this is uh, an early experiment in testing a range of digital visualization technologies directed uh, at the selected dress designs. Returning to London, the pattern cutters made a blue toile of the dress design to test it being scaled to the measurements of our fit model, Kitty Garrett, then an MA fashion design student. Photographic studies of the front, back and side view of the dress, very much inspired by Madeleine Vionnet's design registration photographs, helped us to understand the cut and construction of the dress in visual terms but also the need to consider the pose and gesture of the model, and in turn, the walk. Motion tests at college allowed us to consider a contemporary fashion walk against a style of walking employed in Balenciaga salon presentations in the 1960s. And it also allowed us to see what motion brought to an understanding of how the dress moved on the body. And these photographs of the dress in the final fabric at college show some of the visual limitations in using dark as opposed to light coloured fabric to understand the cut and construction of the design. The next stage of the research process involved moving to a motion capture studio at Pinewood Film Studios outside of London. This was to capture the movements of a range of walks for the dress designs, which would be used as data uh, for the walks in the digital animations. These studios are usually used for the film industry and games industry. We wanted to approach the motion capture as an experiment involving not just the fit model on the left, but also a contemporary dancer, Kate Coyne from the Michael Clark company that you see on the right. And I'd just like to advertise the fact that um, a new exhibition um, charting the career of the Michael Clark Company opens in London at the Barbican Art Gallery next week. Um, but back to our project. Using a range of contextual material that we supplied to both models um, of fashion show footage, photographs and written accounts of modelling in each historical period, we sought to document a contemporary walk an historical walk and a stylized walk for each dress design. So here on the left, we see Kitty offering a Balenciaga walk and Kate on the right um, with a stylized Balenciaga walk. And they both wear motion capture suits covered in sensors 
and shoes with the correct heel height for the dress design. This data, alongside the pattern, toile, final fabric dress and contextual material, uh, were all then sent to our tech partner, Change of Paradigm, to create 3D renders of the dress on a mannequin model form of our own design based on Kitty's proportions. And this slide shows some early iterations using the blue color of our toile rather than the original black to more clearly show the behavior of the garment. And this film shows how we compose the final digital animation from a number of composite views with different camera angles and sometimes walks drawn from both models in order to achieve the optimum articulation of the dress design in motion. We also sought to capture movement that expressed a semi-static pose rather than a walk. And this three view film shows the digital animation, the motion capture, and a photographic reference from the contextual evidence, which made a focus of a foot placed forward, which you can see in the choreography of the pose. So I'd now like to turn to the research findings of the project. The project has brought practice-based ways of investigating the making of garments into dialogue with the kind of object-based analysis employed by fashion historians. It has shed new light on the need to understand historical dress, not as solely static, but also on a body in motion, and that this reveals motile and spatial qualities that are illuminating. It places emphasis on the technology of the body as much as the technology of pattern cutting. And it values the principle of co-design in terms of the group of researchers who collaborated on the project, but also in terms of how a contemporary fashion design studio is also a form of co-design and not the space of a single designer. It comes at a time when the fashion industry is forced to rethink the presentational format of the fashion show and the need to show fashion meaningfully in digital and remote terms. And it shows how digital technologies traditionally employed in fashion garment production and fashion e-commerce can be applied over to the museums and gallery sector and to education to be used as a tool to appreciate fashion history in new ways. The research stage of the project is now complete and we are now writing up our findings and we are delighted to announce that an exhibition and publication will be staged at Momu Fashion Museum in Antwerp, scheduled for May 2022. And in this final slide, you can see on the right, uh, the principal investigator of the project and my colleague, Professor Caroline Evans, with the museum director, Kat Debo, and museum curator, Lisa de Weingart, in one of three new ground floor spaces for the museum, uh, where our exhibition will be. In the centre, you can see the architectural plan of that space. And on the left, you can see um, a past exhibition stage at Momu, uh, Game Changers, which was really instrumental in our thinking for this project um, in raising very interesting design genealogies uh, between designers from uh, other area, sorry, other eras in this instance, um, between Balenciaga and an alumnus of our college, Alexander McQueen. We are very excited to take the project forward to its final outputs, and it has been our pleasure to be able to reveal the initial findings at the first International Balenciaga Conference. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you very much, Alastair. Now we'll be passing the floor to Berta Pablo. Good afternoon, everyone, and may I say what an honor it is to represent my research on Cristobal Balenciaga, Master of Geometric Design. Geometric shapes may be simple, but they can be manipulated in complex and artful ways when used in patterns and design. This is why Balenciaga's techniques made him a master of geometric designs. Given the admiration and friendship Balenciaga had for v and her influence on his work, the first section will delve into a comparative analysis of the two couturier style. There have been many books and articles beautifully written on Balenciaga that has given insight into Balenciaga's innovative design style and what influences help shape every aspect of the design from the textiles and embroideries to the buttons he selected. It is clear that these factors helped and shaped his fashion philosophy. What were not always evident at first glance was the geometric shapes. This style, uh, this study will endeavor to shed some additional insight as to why Balenciaga was master of geometric design. For the study analysis, the Royal Ontario Museum Cristobal Balenciaga collection from 1937 to 1967 that consists of dresses and suits were studied. Also as a comparative study analysis, the ROMS Madeleine Viennet silk dress from 1925 is the model referenced. The study required patterns and twelves for fitting in order to gain an in-depth understanding of the techniques used by Balenciaga and the comparative of the V&A dress. The steps and processes in the analysis of each design model would involve, one, photographing all inner and outer details, two, develop the technical sketch, including all relevant measurements and details on Adobe Illustrator, as well as by hand, three, develop the 2D digital pattern and include all grain lines as the original textile design cut. The software that was used is patternated design or PAD software. Four, the printout of the digital pattern. Five, reconstructing and fitting of the 12. And six, documenting the geometric attributes. The example of the 12s created is highlighted in the slide and includes the prototype of the Balenciaga pearl button. The ROMS Madeleine Viennet silk dress presented a unique opportunity to study the design and cut of the textile and the sewing techniques used in the atelier. The main geometric attributes of this dress is the careful manipulation of the crisscrossing pin tucks that form the rhombus grid, which creates the bias stretch. The back follows the same geometric grid, but continues from the side to the upper back of the dress with the same crisscrossing grid, which forms the soft pleats in the neckline and uh, shoulder area of the dress. The 12 tested proved essential insight into the sewing of the six millimeter pin tucks, as each must be sewn at an exact 45 degree angle and careful calculation of the grid sequence was essential to maintain the center front exacting grid pattern. The center front triangular formation of the grid was an additional uh, geometric attribute of the design. The reproduction of the original dress pattern revealed the design of precision accuracy of the rhombus grid, which intersects to form the soft drape and the bias styling that v was known for. For the silk blouse, it was important that the analysis include the Balenciaga wool boucle suit that the blouse was a part of. 
the perfectly shaped collar at the jacket and the rounded neckline at the blouse, along with the bracelet length sleeve of both the jacket and the blouse is indicative of the classic Balenciaga suit style. The two beautiful embellished passementiri buttons on the front jacket were another detail of the Spanish elegance and bold geometric shape. The main geometric attributes are a complex and clever combination of shapes. The design evolution starts from the basic square and takes on circular and triangular forms and transforms to a main rectangular pattern piece. The final pattern waistline shaping is formed with a series of pleats consisting of three on each quarter of the waistline. Important to note that the pleats are placed on a slight angular fold uh, which will connect to the peplum waist uh, yoke. The silk satin yoke peplum is made up of two quarter circles and the center backs are cut on the textile salvage as noted in my pattern. The uh, final pattern, uh, you can see the, uh, the pleats which were uh, on an angular fold and very carefully uh, planned out. The twelve provided an essential insight into the exact waistline and pleat placement. The underarm dart, uh, darting cutout creates an exact 45 degree angle and is essential to the design and also enables the bias movement of the sleeve underarm. Balenciaga and VNA key observations in these two styles, although different, were there were similar attributes and they were, uh, both textiles were of a comparative quality and drape. Both knew how to manipulate the design and a limited, limited amount of pattern pieces to create complex design silhouettes. Both used bias to achieve uh, design and movement. VNA's geometric design was achieved through the grid, whereas Balenciaga's geometric design achieved through the design evolution with hidden geometric shapes that are also used in the technical design development of his origami style blouse. Another example of Balenciaga's skill of achieving the geometric design through hidden geometric shapes is the ROM's silk wrap blouse from 1962. This style shape was masterfully developed with elongated trapezoid back panels and front side triangular extensions that create a natural bias in the drape when wrapped. This blouse is also in the Cristobal Balenciaga Museum archives, which is very interesting. Important to note that the wrap blouse style facing on both the front and back did not include interfacing. Clearly Balenciaga wanted the textile to maintain the fluidity of the silk in the drape. It was also noted in both of the original and the 12 that when the front and back joined at the side seams, the shape formation was of a perfectly oval curved outline. The triangular insert and extensions of the pattern design detail can also be seen in VNA's um, book uh, by Betty Kirk. Uh, which is uh, titled Madeline VNA. Buttons and grids. Just as important to Balenciaga and his design style was the embellishments used in his collections. The ornate buttons used by Balenciaga on his jackets and coats have always been unique and symbolic of his style. The example of the oversized passementary embellished buttons seen in the red suit jacket were a main focal point of the jacket design. The buttons were sewn onto the jacket only as an accessory. The actual closure of the jacket was the inner snaps on the front. Further analysis revealed that the passementary braid was in a radiating grid formation and were made up of two circles within the grid design. The second button analyzed was the pearl buttons, 
They were a unique style and evoked elegance and most certainly a key focal point to the coat they belonged to. The pearl beads used to form the buttons were five millimeters in size and they were a sphere grid sequence that covered another inner sphere which was covered in beige silk. The finished diameter of the button was one inch or 2.5 centimeters. The third button was a cylindrical shape that had been dyed to match and had a three quarter inch uh, diameter or two centimeter diameter. The three buttons all uh, had geometric design details. The Balenciaga geometric design of the button style did not only include the buttons. He also combined unique geometric embroidery techniques around bound buttonholes. This unique buttonhole detail can be seen in a black silk ottoman coat in the Hamish Bowles book, Balenciaga in Spain. Capes and design. The elegance and nobility of the cape has been used by Balenciaga with his innovative use of textiles, style and length variations. The sculptural form of the capes and the textile selection uh, was an essential element of how the cape was going to drape on the intended design. Balenciaga's range of tex uh, textiles used in various cape styles was varied in uh, such textiles as a silk gazar, silk cloquet, silk fail, shot silk, white mink fur, and wool crepe. Balenciaga was no means the only designer to use capes in his collection, and v &A was has also used cape styles in her collection. However, he expanded the range in both the textiles he used and the multitude of design variations. The Balenciaga double wool crepe cape in the ROM collection was carefully analyzed in order to understand some of his techniques and calculation used to achieve the geometric shape of the design style. The cape was part of an ensemble which consisted of a sleeveless dress in wool crepe and contrasting ivory, uh, satin and silk. Important to note that the wool crepe dress um, and silk satin yoke are cut on the bias. The soft shoulder gather, uh, gathering created a beautiful shoulder curve and as an accent piece, each shoulder had a silk satin bow that was also cut on the bias. The details of the dress are important in order to understand the design of the cape. The fact that the dress had an extended drop shoulder style and the added accent pieces of the bow made it impossible to wear a conventional suit jacket and therefore the cape was a perfect addition to the ensemble. The cape is a unique design uh, style due to the fact that it is made up of two joined half circles and which makes up the one circle. It is a varying length and the under cape has cylindrical sleeves and transforms from that transform from the under cape. Also of note is the cut of the under cape center back darting that radiates from the hem and aids in the reduction and shaping of the hem circumference. The shape has been carefully molded and contours to the neck shoulder area with the use of radiating dart placements from the neckline. Each of the capes upper and lower cape pieces were fully lined the neckline is finished with a narrow bias band that fastens in the front with a snap closure. The complexity of the double cape presented a unique opportunity to retrace and test the technique and measurements used by Balenciaga. The method would involve using pi, and pi is the ratio between the circumference and the di diameter of the circle. Once the required circles are calculated, then the dart placement and reduction is applied to achieve the same circumference as each of the original capes. The process and calculation can be seen in my diagram as noted on the slide. Also important to note that in uh, VNA's uh, use and calculation of patterns, uh, it is also listed in Betty Kirk's book, her use of the quadrants as I've listed in my diagram. 
The Cape 12 revealed that Pi calculation worked and assisted in determining an accurate sleeve location to the under cape. Essential to the cape fit was the dart placement and the slight curve of the dart legs and center back seams as seen in the final pattern. The radical cut and shape of the evening dress. Among the unique pieces in the ROM collection are the breathtaking evening wear dresses that are a symbol of the Balenciaga Spanish influence and elegance. One of these exquisite pieces is the black silk taffeta and lace with asymmetrical bubble hem. In many of the books and articles on Balenciaga, this is one of the dresses most likely included in the images, as in this image from the Women's Wear Daily 1951. The outer graceful beauty of the dress almost doesn't do justice to the inner workings of this astonishing dress. Every detail of the design and textile cut and sewing has been carefully planned out. The lace is masterfully worked in both the cut and invisible seam connection of the lace, which has carefully placed triangular godet inserts that enable the dress to fit over the curves of the body. The importance of this dress is the hidden geometric design. There were multiple triangular inserts on three different layers, which included all three types of triangles, the equilateral triangle, isosceles triangle, and the scalene triangle. An additional point is the skirt bubble is made up of two circles and doubles again with the gathers, hence the voluminous design detail and you can see in that my uh, image that I took with the skirt open on the table, how voluminous that uh, the circles are. Fit and geometric design. A further analysis of a Balenciaga lin linen suit from his early years in his Par uh, Parisian atelier, 1937, reveals some of his earlier design and fit techniques. The jacket is a collarless soft shoulder with a kimono sleeve style that included an underarm gusset for movement. The full length skirt was of particular interest as it provided a unique insight into the fit of the one piece upper skirt that included front and back. The total of eight darts contouring around the waistline created a perfect fit when tested in the 12 and as seen on the mannequin in the original suit and ROM image. Additionally important to the fit was the back waistline that had been lowered by 1.25 inches or three centimeters and contoured to the curve of the back. The full flounce of the lower skirt created a beautiful cascading drape the design was created for ease of movement, given that there is a center front slit and the raised center back. This style is additional proof that Balenciaga carefully took all aspects of design, fit and movement into his design plan. At first glance, the skirt looks like a simple silhouette. However, the pattern and twelve revealed a beautiful combination of technical skill and design in design and fit. In conclusion, the research focused on the element of the geometric design and techniques used by a great master of design and attempted to do justice and pay respect to his brilliant work. The first portion of the research was the comparison of Madeleine BNA and Balenciaga's design style and techniques and revealed direct similarities of the two couturiers. But Balenciaga expanded further into the geometric design with his origami style blouse and the geometric shapes revealed. The research further revealed that hidden within the structural shapes of the Balenciaga designs were the fundamental geometric pieces that enable the astonishing designs of Balenciaga. The research revealed the importance of the selection of the textiles that Balenciaga used in his design style. This was a requirement that enabled the structural geometric shape and drape of the designs. Throughout the research of Balenciaga and his work, much of the literature on his life describes him as a quiet and reserved individual. 
completely devoted to his work. Researching Balenciaga's geometric design, one appreciates the level of the undivided attention to detail and the intensity of his concentration when developing his designs. Although the research analysis of Cristobal Balenciaga geometric design style reveals that there were similar details and shapes to that of Madeleine Viennet, the techniques and design style of Balenciaga made him unique and forever an influence in fashion design. I'd like to take the opportunity to thank the Royal Ontario Museum and Dr. Alexander Palmer for making it possible for me to do the research. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Berta Pavlov. And our last speaker uh, is Anna, well, our last speakers, Anna Santa Maria and Sergio Roman. The title of our talk is Intuition beyond Japanism. The relationship, the relationship between Balenciaga and the aesthetics of emptiness. We'd like to thank the organizers for giving us the opportunity for the, the, giving us the opportunity to participate in today's event and the museum as well. We'd like to start with the photo of Cristobal Balenciaga, which shows us the fashion designer in a pensive uh, gesture, in a pensive pose. This image illustrates one of the key themes of this uh, talk, the use or the importance of intuition in both Balenciaga's practice, praxis and also in his designs a praxis which is imbued with the idea of emptiness. But we're talking about intuition in a number of different ways. First of all, in relation to his uh, skill, he was a maestro, a maestro with a deep understanding of the techniques and also an expert in taking creative designs, which are very far off from rationalism. His hand has almost as much protagonism as his mind. Now, the second meeting of meaning of intuition has to do with overcoming formal stimuli, especially in relation to Japanese styles and textiles, which is why we have entitled this talk Intuition Beyond Japanism. But there's a third meaning of the word intuition, which Anna Santa Maria will be talking about, and that has to do with an ethical and aesthetic position of the designer in relation to emptiness. We will first of all talk about uh, some of the relationship aspects of the relationship between Balenciaga and Japanism. He was influenced by uh, Japanese styles, which were so popular during the first decades of the 20th century, thanks to Paul Paulet and Madeleine Bionet. Our theory here uh, coincides with what Michael Paxenberg says. The word influence means or talks about a transfer, often hierarchical transfer, of a style and how this can in fact give rise to fictitious relationships of dependence between the two agents involved. According to Baxendal, if we look at Cezanne and Picasso, we can see the richness of the relationship between these two artists. Because without Cezanne, Picasso's work would have been very different. 
Now, if we have a look at some of the Japanese works and, and how they erupted into the Western world, it was very sudden. And it all happened in about the mid 1900s or 1800s, mid 19th century. The art of Japan, Japanese art, flooded Europe like a, a great big tidal wave. And Europe was fascinated by uh, Japanese art, Japanese style, especially in the second half of the 20th century. We have the patterns, the ukijoi, as we call them, the patterns, which became very, very popular in Europe. Collecting the collection of objects included many objects uh, which were Japanese. This uh, we can see in the work of Claude Monet, Toulouse-Lautrec and Henri Matisse as well. Uh, Renoir as well. And there are many other examples too. But when we're talking about imitating uh, the, the garment, the, this copy, this imitation, almost became a caricature. The volumetric representation of the kimono, as we can see here in the painting by Claude Monet, isn't really representative of the Japanese essence. It's much more uh, representative of this Japanese essence, what we can see on the right-hand side of the screen, a painting by Henri Matisse. Because here we can see very much the idea of emptiness, the idea of vacuum, unfilled spaces. And in fact, if we, Angel González has said, what the lady on the right we can see is wearing is not the kimono itself, but the reflection of the kimono. The kimono reflected in the water. The reflection of the kimono in the water is much more Japanese than the kimono itself. So we can see that this visual intuition of Matisse, locating the essence of the garment in its reflection rather than in its actual object, is much more representative of the Japanese mindset. Now this intuition uh, I think underpins the relationship between Balenciaga and Japan. It's a subtle relationship, much more in idea than in the formal shapes. He does adopt some fundamental ideas of the Japanese aesthetic, but not the tradition itself. What he does is he updates the cultural baggage that has arrived in Europe, and in fact anticipates it to some extent. There are two eras that we can identify in the evolution of Cristobal Balenciaga. First of all, uh, we have the beginning, the early years, up to 1937, in which he leaves Spain when the civil war breaks out. And this is when he really started to master his trade. He often uh, traveled to Paris, and he learned from some of the best maestros there. This is when he reached the pinnacle of his technical skill by copying and imitating, and Madeleine Bionet uh, is a key figure in this particular phase. Now, he had training in a wide range of different areas, but in fact, Balenciaga didn't just copy what uh, the garments he was exposed to. He went one step beyond that. And this is, in fact, quite representative and quite uh, evocative of Oriental masters and what they did as well. In Chinese art, uh, often we see that there is a copy of old artworks, copying painters of the past, but also using their inspiration and trying to update it. Now, the second phase that Balenciaga went through when he was in Paris was uh, when he developed a, a very strong Spanish touch and influence, 
as we can see in some of the pieces in the Tyson Museum in Madrid. But he also developed some of the values of his uh, profession, and his work becomes represented, or the hallmarks of his work, silence and emptiness. And again, this took Europe by storm, and it was very reminiscent of Zen Buddhism, for example. And now I'm going to pass over to my colleague, Ana Santa Maria. Good afternoon. I would like to repeat the words of thanks that my, uh, my colleague Sergio has uh, directed towards the organizers of the conference. It's, uh, and I'm delighted to be here to share with you the second part of this talk. Those who knew Balenciaga said that he liked silence and that he was a deeply religious, almost mystic, type of man. Silence helps him to tap in to his inner creativity. And the Zen aesthetic, which you can see very clearly in uh, Oriental landscape painting, is also evident in his designs. This emptiness can gradually be appreciated over Valenciaga's career. It gradually evolves. It's very evident, especially in some of his, his last creations. Cristóbal Valenciaga worked in silence, and he worked with his hands. Manual work generates... I don't know if any of you have ever worked with your hands, you'll know. It, uh, it almost induces a trance-like state. State, And uh, from that silence, the intellect grows. Now, Balenciaga wasn't an intellectual. He worked with his hands. And Manuel Ungaro, one of his disciples, said that his maestro wasn't an intellectual. He based his work on doing and and he always said to his apprentices, uh, stop drawing, stop drawing, you have to do it, you have to make, you have to reinvent everything as you go. So he was a, a master craftsman, uh, almost like a master craftsman from medieval times. Now, he, at the beginning of the 20th century, we had thinkers such as René Guénaud, they were talking about arts and crafts and the craft-like uh, aspect of art and the separation between fine art and craft. And there were philosophers which were worked in the field of pragmatism. And this was all happening at the same time as Balenciaga was growing up and learning his trade. And we have uh, Juhanis and Richard Senna, the sociologist, more recent sociologist, also talk about the creative power of the hand and all of this has been rooted in Eastern craftsmanship and how they learn through the repetition of the gestures by copying their master in silence. This unconscious repetition of complex gestures and answers that can't be conceptualized. Balenciaga abandoned his career in 1968, a moment at which haute couture began to collapse with the advent of Pret-a-Porter. And there was an advent uh, or an increase in other values, values perhaps which he didn't agree with. 
The presence of the hand was important, but also the eloquence of the materials that he used. This was so important to him. Again, a connection here can be drawn between Oriental art and Oriental philosophy as well. And also, you can see some of the architectural touches that his dresses had. And the visual qualities didn't eclipse the essence of what he did. When you're standing in front of uh, his dresses, the dresses they have in Getaria, this is self-evident. The feeling that is provoked and triggered by these textures, by these shapes, is really quite palpable. Now, continuing on with this idea of silence, this is a common practice among many artists. And if uh, we think about Marcel Proust, where well, in fact he lined his room with cork so that he could be in silence, in almost like a bubble of silence as he wrote his very famous work In Search of Lost Time. And the silence that reigned in Balenciaga's atelier, I think, is a hallmark of his identity and can be seen and is evident in his garments. Silence in doing, silence in work, silence in the shows as well that he put on, silence in the name that he never actually gave to any of his collections. Um, this silence has been reflected in the work, for example, of Eduardo Chiida. And it harks back to the Japanese view of silence as well. Now, we don't know whether Balenciaga knew about this uh, oriental philosophy about silence. Perhaps it was something he learned, along with so many other things that he learned through his lifetime. But many of his creations can clearly be interpreted on the basis of the aesthetics of emptiness, uh, as it is understood in Japan. I think Chi either really reflects this idea perfectly in the sculpture that is called Tribute to Balenciaga from 1990, two large blocks of metal, uh, which together form the silhouette of a woman. It's full of possibility, this silence and it talks about the fullness of the body. According to academics, fashion experts, Balenciaga understood the internal space of, uh, of his garments. And in fact, it was an element that appeared in many of his creations right up to the very end. This idea of va vacuum, of space between the body and the fabric. Uh, and it's true that Balenciaga's creations didn't punish the wearer's bodies. They gave them space. They gave them freedom. They weren't like hard carcasses, which so many other creations were like, especially in the Western world although some people have interpreted it as a means of denying the female form because the traditional form in the western world suits and clothes and clothing has always modeled the body has always restricted the body but the vacuum that we can see in the creations of Balenciaga are a place for the body they give the body a place because it leaves another space between the body and the garment. So there is emptiness between the body and the garment. And it doesn't limit the expressiveness of the body. It just gives the body a space for it to manifest itself. And this emptiness uh, in the Eastern world has always been connected to freedom. And in Balenciaga, the expressiveness of the figure doesn't disappear, it isn't lost. It's there, and it's there very strongly because the body has been liberated underneath this fabric. 
A poet once said, for the Eastern world, art is to contemplate an object until it can be adapted to an internal rhythm. So in short, you can't deny the eloquence of the body in Balenciaga's creations just because you can't see it, you can't appreciate it. And all of this can be linked to the architectural ideas or the architectural design in Japan, which is understands a building as interrelated spaces. In a Japanese house, this concept is applied to the elements inside an airy, light, open space, and also in the distribution of these spaces, and also the differentiation between different atmospheres. It's talking about the flexible relationship between the interior and the exterior of the dwelling. We also know that Bolenciaga really connected and felt a strong connection with the heart of Japanese aesthetics. And I think proof of that is the success in the 1950s of some of the silhouettes created by the designer, as Ana Balda says in her thesis, or in the fact that the emptying of the space between the garment and the body, beyond formal relationships with the traditional kimono, for example, was one of the pillars of contemporary Japanese fashion. Especially if we look at Miyake and his creations, creations. This is a similar approach, a similar approach that we can identify in the work of Balenciaga. Uh, landscape painting, Japanese landscape painting, doesn't only focus on objects. It also focuses on what is not seen. In some Japanese landscapes, we see the emptiness behind the clouds and everything is enveloped in this very unspecific and blurred environment. Mikuisi, Nick Bassi in 2006, also tried to explore the essence of this silence, the mysterious inside of the Balenciaga creations. Uh, it was a masterful cutting of the pieces with no linings ever. Now we can see them. Uh, there are different specific elements, such as buttons, for example, which were used in order to create this inside space. Emptiness, this emptiness was the silent testimony of a woman's body. Now, if Eugenio Borges uh, came, would, come, came to, would come to uh, the museum in Getaria, he would perhaps invent some new categories to describe the, the, uh, the fashion designer, who says it was a form that enables the body to be covered and yet fly at the same time. And the suit, as it uh, covers the body, announces the absolute triumph of emptiness. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ana Santa Maria and Sergio Roman. So now we're going to go with the last round of uh, questions. The first question is for Ruth Valentin. It comes from Lyon and it's by Alexandrine. And she says, thank you very much for your talk. I would like to know whether you have been in contact with other museums that hold pieces by Vionnet in order to determine whether any of them can serve a model similar to the one you have just shown us, uh, others from the same year or other wedding dresses or other garments with common characteristics. Thank you. 
Thank you for the question. Yes, I have contacted different institutions in Spain, but they didn't find any pieces by Bionet. I did carry out a general search uh, for wedding dresses from the same year just to see if there were any similarities or to see that if I could compare them with uh, the wedding dress, but to date, I wasn't able to find anything that was similar so that I could, compa that I could compare it with. Thank you very much, Ruth. Now, the next question is for Cesar and Nadia. Thank you very much for discovering this wonderful work. I th get the feeling that this is the start of a of the materials used in a specific date. Have you used other analyses and techniques uh, with similar works? Have you carried out non-destructive uh, tests in some of the of some of the other pieces in other museums? Taking samples for analysis because those are uh, destructive techniques, but in this case we choose to to do to proceed like that because it was very interesting to know more about the degradation process involved in the sequence and also relate to the dating because our goal uh, finally was to date and to uh, recognize who was the embroidery atelier of this artwork. So the reason why we choose to analyze those uh, sequence that are destructive techniques uh, was based more for knowing more uh, the material than the, um, than the um, uh, who, who will you say it? Before the 30s, most of the most of the sequence were based with other other type of materials. We did a non-destructive technique that was based with uh, drop uh, reagent that is named diphenylamine spot test. Uh, that is more less destructive test, but uh, that you only can gain the surface of the material. That is, in this case, was the nitrate cellulose. So the reason of analyzing the, the sequence was to know more what was the nucleo, the, the main uh, base of the sequence. And this case was galatite, and that is a modern plastic that was developed uh, after the 1920s. So that was very important information, and that was the reason why we uh, forward with the destructive analyze techniques. Uh, plus, for us, for our collection, for Kunstmuseum collection, it is also very important to know the plastic components in order to uh, make the proper plan for conservation. Plastic always uh, are very problematic uh, uh, materials in museum collections. So in order to know more what are the right measures to keep them safe in storage rooms, we forward to these analytic techniques. I hope that is more or less answered. La siguiente pregunta es para Berta Paulov. Miguel, desde Barcelona. Muchas gracias por su intervención. Thank you very much for your talk. You said that Vionet's influence is, high, influence is highly present in Balenciaga. And several earlier talks have also pointed towards the same idea. If we're speaking about geometry, the bias cut is based on the figure of the triangle. It has been said that Balenciaga has an even more geometrical form or style than Bionet. Can you explain this a little more? Based on your exhaustive research, what geometrical figure do you see as predominant in Balenciaga? Would you say there are more triangles, circles, rectangles? What? Thank you very much. Oh, yes, thank you very much for the question, and, and it, is, um, it, is a really, um, it is a really good uh, question, um, and I, I found that from the, uh, from the 
from the, the my research that I looked at uh, in the pieces of for um, on Balenciaga in comparison to VNA, the main geometric pieces that uh, I saw uh, within uh, Balenciaga, so pieces of the ROM collection anyway, uh, the triangular pieces and the circle uh, and were the, I found the main ones that uh, were evident in many of the, uh, especially in the evening wear uh, dresses. And there were some really amazing pieces that I was so excited about. And I wanted to bring, uh, do more uh, patterns for, um, for the presentation, but um, they, are, they are very complex. And within all of those pieces, it was clear that the triangular uh, the bias cut, the circle were were uh, shapes that were completely um, uh, a part of his design uh, techniques. So it it uh, was quite evident um, in his style, and uh, so uh, this is why I feel that he really took the uh, geometric uh, shapes further than VNA. But fo both very very important designers. Thank you. Thank you very much, Berta. Next question is for Sergio Roman and Anna, from Jane from New York. And she says, like you say, many things fall into the category of the Japanese influence, aspects linked to what you call the aesthetics of emptiness, yet most researchers agree that Balenciaga's designs are timeless. So based on your studies, do you think there is a relationship between these two concepts, or these three concepts, Japanism, emptiness, and timelessness? Thank you. Um, well, I'll, I'll start answering that question. So, the relationship between Japanism, emptiness, and timelessness. What was the third one? He can't remember the third one. What was the third one? Timelessness, that's right. Uh, perhaps the third one, it, it can be perhaps less than the Japanism. When we define emptiness, as we define, as we d define emptiness here, it's more licked, uh, linked to Japan than to Japanism. Because as uh, in the middle of the 19th century, some of these properties come more divorced from Japanism and Japan at that time. In the second phase of his development, from 1936 onwards when he was in Paris, he adopted new values and he forged a new relationship with Japan which was quite innovative and it coincided with a new wave of Japanese influences which weren't quite so formal and which came about in the post-war period and can be seen in different uh, artistic works as well, uh, plastic arts, painting, architecture and music as well. It's uh, at least in the sense in which we understand it in our research. And emptiness, yes, of course. Emptiness uh, has a number of different abstract components which have connections with the technical side of things and the aesthetic side of things and even the spiritual side of things as well, as we have tried to explain. Thank you very much, Sergio. The next question is for, is for is from Victoria de Lorenzo, who from Glasgow asks Alistair. Have you carried out a comparative analysis of the subject object relationship according to contemporary gestuality and a relationship that, we, that recreates the manners, gestures, and the restrictions of a possible client in accordance with the social norms of the era in which the garment was created. I'm asking myself, I'm wondering whether there is some kind of difference, uh, especially uh, it, when the garments were adapted to the different customers and if perhaps they were designed for a specific event. Thank you very much. Okay, so um, 
I would start by saying um, that the contextual material that we kind of developed in order to um, consider Poe's uh, gesture and walk in relation um, to the dress design um, wasn't particularly an exact science. I don't think it's possible to faithfully um, reenact or, or reproduce uh, historical um, po forms of pose um, or gesture. Um, and I think the experiment was really um, an attempt to try and see how uh, a, a contemporary body might be able to enter, in, enter into a, a historicized form of movement. Um, I think what's really interesting about the question that you've asked is that it, it, it considers how the client might adjust not only a dress design, but perhaps the experience of being within that dress design too. And what's interesting about the dress design that we chose for Balenciaga, drawn from the um, Balenciaga archives in Paris, is that it's a model dress. So it's not a finished dress design. It's likely to have been worn um, by uh, a model of the Maison to present the design to clients for purchase. Um, there's an unfinished quality to it. Um, so the seam allowances are raw. Um, there are sections to um, the incomplete lining that's missing. There's uh, even um, small sections of cloth uh, out of the return of the hem. Um, and what's nice about it is you get the sense of the of, of the the object being in process that it hasn't yet finally met its subject um, through the made to measure process so um, for the research team it was a very important um, garment design choice for the very fact that it objectifies that sense of being in process, I suppose, in terms of that subject-object relationship between uh, garment and wearer. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alistair. The next question is also for you. And it's also from someone who is called Victoria, but it's not the same Victoria. She comes from Madrid. And she says, I really enjoyed hearing about your project. I'd like to know whether, during your study of patterns, you were able to identify the work of any specific pattern maker or cutter, or if you've discovered any references to any particular names. Okay, so um, within the, the chosen dress design was a, a white tape label um, which said February 1966, Nina 185, Claude. And from that, we were able to deduce that the pattern pieces um, uh, and the dress design uh, came out of the atelier of uh, Madame Claude. Uh, one of the uh, pattern cutters who remained faithful to Balenciaga throughout his career. Madame Claude um, was with him from 1937 to 1968 um, across the, the, the span of the company, but she was not alone. There was also uh, Madame Felisa, uh, Madame Jeanette, and also uh, Madame Susie. Um, Madame Felisa was interesting in that she... Um, her atelier was known not only for dresses, but also suits. Um, but Madame Claude specialised in dresses alone. Um, and we were, we were particularly interested in developing um, more research around Madame Claude and the contribution that she, that she particularly made to the Maison in terms of her approach to pattern cutting. Um, certainly what we found uh, in our research for the project is that uh, fashion designers tend to work with a, a range of, of pattern cutters who are technically proficient not just in flat pattern cutting but also draping on the stand which is also known as modeling and they're often employed by the designer because they excel in a um, particular technique or a particular approach. Um, 
So I hope that answers the question. Thank you. I'm sure it does. Thank you very much, Alastair. The next question is for Nadia, and it comes from Budapest. And he says, do you have any information about the uh, number of workshops uh, who actually worked for Valenciaga during the high point of his, uh, his career? And are any of them opening to working with new young Craftsman? Um, thank you. Thank you for the question. I do understand the first part, so I'm going to try to answer that first. Um, Balenciaga worked with multiple embroidery ateliers. Um, I, I think, in my opinion, that he had a certain preference for Rebe because Rebe worked for him um, every single season and with a quite good amount, or uh, like with a huge amount of styles um, every season throughout the 20 years that they collaborated together. Um, so I can mention, obviously, Le Sage, um, that were for him a lot once Rebe had closed in 66, 67, 68. Um, he did a lot of work with Bataille. Bataille was um, an embroidery house that started in the tens and twenties and that worked for Mademoiselle Chanel at some point. So they did develop things together and Bataille was um, the atelier responsible of a lot of uh, the very beautiful embroideries for Balenciaga before the war. A lot of the jet embroideries, black passementerie, you know, this kind of like more traditional approach to embroidery. Um, Balenciaga also worked with Urel, um, with Ginisti and Kenol that were um, also embroidering for Dior at the time. Um, he might have worked with Vermont and um, also with Lanel, but maybe on a later period. Um, so yeah, he, he employed multiple, multiple embroidery suppliers um, and had certain preferences for certain techniques on each of them. Um, just, yeah, from the top of my head, um, Marie-André Jouve, uh, on the catalogue uh, for the exhibition that she did in Lyon in 85, she details a lot of these uh, embroidery suppliers and she did a, a wonderful job. And I, I have to thank her because we've been talking uh, for the past three years and she has given me so many elements on this. Um, so yeah, I think he, he had a, a wide range of choice to pick from. Um, so that's my answer to the first half of the question. And I really didn't get the second half of the question. Would you mind repeating? Yeah, the second part of the question asks, the, the major, um, the, do the major houses really, are, are they willing to work with craftsmen who are just starting out, sort of new players on the scene? Are they willing to work with them? That was the question. Uh, um, I, I, I guess that he's meaning today. Um, yeah, of course. Um, I think that I mean, I, I work for one of the oldest embroidery houses. Um, well, it's it's the only the the oldest one. Uh, we have 140 years of history, um, and our main clients are obviously the big houses: Christian Dior, Chanel, Valentino, Armani, among others. But when there is someone that we really believe in um, and and who is interesting for us, like creatively, and and I think. If there's a collaboration, I think if there's if there's um, the same spirit and the same interest um, in developing new and innovative embroideries and taking taking the technique further, yeah, of course. I don't. I mean, we we work for many different backgrounds and and many different companies, including um, jewelry companies, not necessarily haute couture ones. We work for interiors. Um, I think embroidery can be applied to so many different surfaces and and to so many different extents that it would be silly of us not to consider working for other than just the big names. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Nadia. Answer the question, sorry. Now, the next question is uh, a question from Julie Elba for Berta Pavlov. Thank you very much for your fascinating talk. Now, bearing in mind the importance of the book by Betty Kirk for fashion historians, are you thinking of publishing your research based on patterns, just like the book by Kirk? Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much for the question. And uh, as a matter of fact, the, um, the research that I am doing uh, is also a lead up to um, uh, the upcoming uh, Couture show, which is going to be uh, at the Royal Ontario Museum 2023. And uh, within that, there will be a chapter on um, DNA patterns and uh, Balenciaga's research that I've done. So um, that is um, something that is in, in the works. And um, pattern making is something, it's a love that I have. And I, I have, um, I really uh, enjoy uh, delving into the actually de designers techniques and um, pattern making. Uh, and But I do it on a digital format as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Berta. The next question is for Ana Santa Maria, and it's a question uh, by Isabel. Congratulations on your very, very interesting talk and your wonderfully sensitive comments. You've talked about Balenciaga's profound religiousness, so something that was mentioned yesterday. Could you share with us perhaps some additional biographical details over and above your interpretation of his silent craftsmanship? I think this is important for us to get a more holistic idea of the identity of Cristóbal Balenciaga. Thank you very much. I, I, I heard it in uh, Spanish. Sorry, I heard it in English, and I would like to be able to hear it in Spanish. So, shall I say, shall I, over the in English interpreting channel, would you like me to do it that that way? Bueno. <laughs> <laughs> Le felicito por su intensa y interesantísima conferencia. Oh. Sí, fenomenal. Okay. Congratulations on your intense and very interesting conference or talk and your wonderfully sensitive comments. You talked about Balenciaga's deep-rooted religiousness, something that was talked about yesterday. Could you share some other biographical details of him over and above your interpretation of his silent craftsmanship? I think it's important in order to get a more holistic idea of his identity. Thank you very much for the question. Question. Most all the biographers uh, that talk about Balenciaga always talk about that, his religiousness. Our talk and our, our presentation, my presentation and Sergio's presentation, also uh, it perhaps ties in with our specialist area. But, which is history of art, but also has to do with aesthetic. Not just talking about his religiousness. It's just the fact that the manual work carried out by a craftsman or a craftswoman gives rise to a kind of inner emptiness or emptying, and in silence, creativity can flourish. So this formed part of his personality. Um, these uh, biographical data or aspects, I think you can find in many different books and biographies, uh, specialists who have actually been studying his personality and the people, all the people that, 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 that knew him. Our presentation focuses on more aesthetic uh, aspects, as Sergio said a little bit earlier. Aspects that had to do with in cultural exchanges, and of course, we didn't get time to explain them all properly in, in our talk. But uh, I think that a, a, more, a deeper rooted, uh, also a more extensive research would probably come up with a few surprises, I think, in this area. 
Muchísimas gracias, Ana. Thank you very much, Ana. The last question is from from is for Berta, and it's uh, Enrique asks this, and he says, first of all, thank you very much, Berta, for your wonderful talk. I would like to ask you, what do you think the link could be between Balenciaga's geometrical and volumetric designs with some Japanese designers, such as Miyaki O, oh, or even the work of some Japanese architects, contemporary Japanese architects? What would the link be? I, I think that that's an excellent question, and I think the link uh, is directly into the structural uh, lines of the patterns uh, very much uh, relates to in both uh, in both accounts and uh, uh, I and I think it's also in that those structural and simplistic lines and yet very complex in in the cut so I, I think the uh, um, uh, it, it's very much it goes hand in hand so he uh, was brilliant, but he, he was uh, really good at uh, capturing um, this, the structural and simplistic lines and, and, sh um, and yeah, it shows in the pattern work. And I uh, was really thrilled to see, to see that as well. I hope I answered the question. <laughs> Thank you very much, Berta, and thank you to all the speakers. It has been a pleasure to have uh, had you with us this afternoon. Right now, we're coming to the end of this first international conference on Cristobal Valenciaga, in which we have listened, uh, we've heard many original and hitherto unpublished contributions and uh, thoughts. Now, in conferences of this kind, uh, usually someone draws some kind of conclusions, brings together all the ideas that we've heard. Now, to do that, we have Miren Vives, who's the director of the Cristobal Balenciaga Museum, who's going to sum up, uh, by way of conclusion, all of these different contributions, important contributions made about Balenciaga that has been carried out over the last two days. Uh, it's been a pleasure for me to be with all of you, and for now, I will pass the floor over to Miren Vives. Good afternoon, good evening everyone. It's almost night here in Getaria. The hours went by quickly in the second day of the conference. As director of uh, the museum, I have uh, to close up and underline some aspects and show the conclusions obtained through the different papers and contribute with our vision as a museum. Alexandra Palmer talked about an elusive and uh, ever-present Valenciaga. In the museum, we asked her to do this uh, keynote because she is not one of uh, those authors of the pile of books that she showed in her presentation. And we wanted her to weave together the different communications that were going to uh, take place in a context where she's an expert. And I think her reflections on the business of haute couture, the market of uh, licenses, commercial policies of other houses, and the world of copies has uh, reminded us um, uh, much more um, a complex um, framework uh, related to the mass uh, consumption but also the business of haute couture of the time, uh, introducing also the rest of topics of the conference. The uh, panel on biographic aspects left us with more questions than answers, and this is fantastic. The uh, material culture approach in this ca case, the cloth personal clothing uh, suggested by Ben Wyman, is uh, very attractive. It literally paints a picture of a man in flesh and blood, a man that likes to feel comfortable in his uh, spare time. A man with a normal, si no, normal sized man, not a giant, uh, that has grown as he grows older, gains weight. The collection of uh, garments by Bal of Balenciaga in our museum is the result of donations from different people, and in some cases, those garments have, have had a second or even a third life after Balenciaga. Their representativity in Balenciaga is measured by these lives as well. And um, we now have to combine the uh, analysis tool, the most sophisticated uh, tools uh, that we can have in, have in our lab, as Ben suggests, in order to know 
better what this uh, atypical collection can contribute with. Thank you, Ben. And I'd like to say something. During the conference, we've received the feedback of a person uh, uh, close to Balenciaga uh, talking about someone mentioning that maybe the level, the quality of the houses in uh, Balenciaga in Spain were lower, ASA in Spain. And that literature says that sometimes they don't have so many materials and so on. But this person says that Valenciaga uh, loved uh, the way her seamstresses, the, the, the Spanish seamstresses worked, like Elisa, Felisa Rigoyen, whom he never had to correct. This is a promising topic in the investigation to contribute with evidences in time that will allow us to contrast hypotheses and testimonials and at the same time an opportunity because this museum has a research, an open research line that gathers testimonials from workers in the house of Spain and France. So these kind of contributions are for us very valuable. So go, now going back to the uh, conference, Julia Elber with her uh, investigation on the relationship between Valenciaga and big edi fashion editors has reminded us a frequent contradiction associated with Valenciaga. How is it possible that this uh, invisible person to the press, uh, somewhat terrifying for some workers, inaccessible for most of uh, his clients, concentrated in his work, almost inquisitorial, um, apparently very introvert, is nonetheless able to fascinate and uh, create um, and have, uh, be friends with very powerful women. This is something that always happens in Valenciaga's trajectory and makes us question also this legend, the legend of this uh, uh, monk creator. The table of the legacy with uh, keynotes by Gabriela Muñagorri and Gabriel Monti has also offered material for reflection. Gesquier was a fundamental piece in um, repositioning of the Valenciaga Prada in the 21st century, based on concepts like timelessness and destruction in Valenciaga's work. With him, a new era in the archive is opened and keeps growing and it becomes an active of the houses, uh, legitimating and empowering going back to legacy in to boost creativity. Gabriela asked uh, the largest question uh, in this sense. Our museum has been working in this line with one of our most international educational pro projects that we call transmission from legacy to creation, with which we create with the present fashion in collaboration with some of the most important schools uh, at the world level, allows us to open up the archive for analysis, analysis and creativity in a new generation of creators. Gabriela Monte, on her part, has talked about the creation and development of the first ex monographic exhibition on Cristobal Valenciaga or on a uh, fashion designer. In 2019, in this museum, we opened up the second exhibition of the series Fashion and Legacy uh, called Contexts. And the goal was to open a frame to understand why and how something that was fashion uh, in the past has become a, a cultural legacy in the Igor Uria talked about this and he mentioned this exhibition. And we think it's a key role in the process of uh, creating a legacy. And we see here something more conceptual between a show and the emotional response of the public looking for an intellectual answer, and it has. Uh, helps us visualize a sort of dichotomy that we face every day. Leber and Bischof Berger are our angel, and I'm not going to say who is who, and they talk to us in uh, each exhibition, and they push us to find a certain balance and commitment, a uh, shake of hands, which is especially important in our case, uh, where all the exhibitions we do are about Valenciaga. It's comforting to see that our dilemmas have at least uh, are at least 30 years old, and our angels and demons have uh, their old features. Thank you, Gabrielle, for this excellent uh, paper that opens up a new debate. The second day didn't leave us cool either. The uh, communications in the international roundtable uh, could be divided into different blocks. 
the value chain of fashion business uh, that works by Victoria Lorenzo and Experienza places us in have uh, placed us upstream and downstream in Valenciaga's business. On the one hand, textile suppliers, a key aspect in the business of the haute couture in which uh, Valenciaga was a master. Dior said, uh, we do with fabrics what we can. Valenciaga does what he wants. And this cannot be done without an exhaustive uh, quest and selection, cooperation and cohabitation with uh, textile providers. Alexander Palman and Victoria Lorenzo herself have talked about this uh, aid system in, in France at that time, with the different quotas. And it's also known that in that intense uh, selection work, Valenciaga set himself no limits, uh, considering the, uh, the quantity, tradition. He preferred to pay uh, more and keep oh, uh, searching for excellency in the market. On the other hand, uh, concerning the bias, uh, the commercialization phase and how the idea of haute couture is perceived in the street is less restricted than uh, the inaccessible salons, uh, let, let us think. In a system of uh, agents, uh, department stores, wholesalers, copy licenses, copies and multi-copies with a whole range of prices and qualities that flooded the market uh, due making the uh, Valenciaga style, style almost ubiquitous. In this case, um, some wholesalers paid uh, more money than private customers in order to access a complete uh, model and be able to create uh, high quality versions. Uh, in England in this case, and explaining uh, the uh, key role of these agents as sources of consolidation and expand expansion of the innovations of Valenciaga. Among them, uh, especially the sack dress that was or was not understood by the public. But it's curious, the uh, sack models that are in our collection didn't belong to clients but they were uh, bought by uh, the workers of the house. Do these women understand better the, the, the vision of Valenciaga than the sophisticated buyers? On the other hand, I also want to clarify something. In the Q&A, uh, we've talked about the uh, Chambre Syndicale de la of the Haute Couture. And he was member uh, of uh, the chamber in 1937. He stayed there until 56. And uh, that year, he, he decided to present his collection one month later in order to uh, protect himself from copyists. But he went back uh, to the uh, Chambre Syndicale in his last years. The last subpanel helps us understand uh, the market dynamics, the different uh, exclusive clients, and the contributions of Guillermo Leon and Kirsten Toftgard, who have traced Valenciaga in countries so different as Mexico or Denmark, are always interesting because they help get out of uh, the usual paradigm and search in other uh, geographies. Modernist uh, roots, craftsmanship, minimalism, practicity of Valenciaga, the northern architect. Uh, shown by Kirsten in contrast by uh, the taste of the traditional style and fashion have been especially interesting. And the link between Valenciaga and Mexico does uh, establish a taste and a clientele and a special social and, uh, and cultural relationship between Mexico and Spain and also illustrators like Barret and Mendes um, mentioned today. The last panel on Valenciaga Creator, I think we have seen a healthy combination of technical analyzers, um, new techniques and technologies, patterns, and other uh, talks uh, that were more conceptual and artistic. Alistair O'Neill has suggested a, a view of archive and introduction to an element that's always um, absent in museums, like movement. Cesar Rodriguez and Nadia Albertini from uh, the reading of a magnificent piece, they have deepened in the relationship of Valenciaga with his uh, providers and their excellency, like Rebe, with uh, their embroideries. In 2016, with the exhibition Valenciaga through lace, 
in co-production with the Cité International de la Dentelle, uh, we uh, saw how sublime these uh, embroideries are, the creators of the models as well. I'd like to underline the efforts uh, by uh, Valentin from our institution to try and restore a piece that was in a very bad shape and that today opens our exhibition uh, next to an installation that uh, reminds the a local church. But apart from this uh, restoration task, the analysis has been very interesting to know the relationship of Valencia with the French houses. Uh, Catherine John de Terlet uh, found the first relation piece by piece in a piece of the collection of the Museum of Hormologue in the Lenven archive, archive. And the relationship with Vionette is also seen in the uh, work presented by Berta Pavlov and the analysis of uh, different figures. Again, the material analysis of the piece allows us to obtain concrete, uh, specific data that help us understand the bias cutting that was so typical in Valencia and that he took to the next level. Sergio Roman and Anda and Santa Maria have uh, deepened in the relationship of the uh, Japanese culture of the concept of Valencia, of the space, the emptiness uh, between the dress and the body, and that others have interpreted so well, like in the sculptures of the uh, Eduardo Chilida, homage oh, 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 to Valencia. And finally, I'd like to underline the uh, active participation, the questions, the participation of the public, which has have been also revealing, opening up the door for new debate. For all those of you who are interested in deepening in what we've seen here, the uh, content of uh, the uh, papers will be uh, published in the minutes of the conferences, of the conference in the website of the museum first semester next year. And you have lost, uh, if you missed any conference, you will receive the links in uh, YouTube. They will be available till uh, the 4th of October. Sunday. And I would like to underline that this is just the beginning. The goals that we sought in this first edition to revive the academic interest in the 150th anniversary of Valencia, opening new research space and creating a community around it have been uh, attained. And I think that we have opened new and promising fields for research in order to know more and know better about the man, the creator, his work, the entrepreneur, and his time. Therefore, we can be happy and uh, we, we are certain that uh, there will be other uh, meetings that will gather all those of us who are interested in the history of fashion and the collections of Valenciaga in Paris at the mid-20th century. Finally, and now really finally, the museum would like to thank uh, to our cooperators uh, for supporting always our task, for their availability, their generosity, to their com the members of the scientific committee, and especially the technical sector Criteria uh, Ana Balda. I'd like to thank also the team of the museum, translators and technicians who have assisted us very patiently in this uh, digital format. And of course, thank you very much to all the participants for their interest and their interesting contributions and to all of you for your attention. We uh, hope to see you in the next edition, uh, of course, in uh, our museum in Italia. Thank you very much.